Good afternoon, everybody, uh, or evening. Uh, welcome. This is the uh, part second town council workshop. Uh, we have a special guest, uh, Levine Planning Strategies. Uh, I'm sorry. Welcome again uh, to the March 2nd, uh, 5.30 Scarborough Town Council Workshop. Uh, we are here to uh, uh, review work done by a consultant that was brought on by the town, uh, Jeff Levine and his partners, uh, to help us uh, understand the, the Downs exemption request. And I know that we've received some public feedback uh, today about whether or not to uh, issue an exemption. I just want to clarify that we are, we're not taking action on an exemption today. Uh, today, we are um, you know, we hired a consultant to help us through this process, and we're going to listen and, and ask questions and batter him about some of the pros and cons of, of the nuances that, that might be associated with doing so. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Jeff Levine, and uh, I think he'll be having one of his partners joining us shortly as well. Well, can you see if uh, Francis, would you yep, like Francis? Francis, in? okay. From Frank. Francis to a... Panelist, I assume. Please. I think he prefers Frank, but okay. is that right? Frank, yeah. And we're going to allow this to be somewhat free flowing. Uh, don't let it get too too far out of hand. Uh, just a wealth of knowledge, and I, I want to you know leverage his time um, as a council. So with that, Jeff. Jeff, do you want me to share the PowerPoint while you're speaking? Sure. Yeah. And I, if I somebody will move them along if I ask, I just sort of yeah. wave. Yeah. Right. Okay. Paul's on in charge of that. Okay. Great. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Well, thanks. Thanks for the in, um, for the invitation to speak and for the uh, for the work you guys do. I always appreciate um, the work of local government. It's hard work, so I appreciate the time you guys spend on this. Um, I wanted to start off by introducing uh, the team and our background, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we were asked to do by the town, and then what are some of our findings are. Um, so next next slide. So basically, uh, our charge first. Um, we were asked to do four things, really three mostly. One is to look at a peer review of the analysis completed. Um, for the um, for the development team um, about the role of uh, residential development in uh, mixed use and downtown developments, because part of the goal here is to build the, a new town center. Um, the second is to potentially talk about public benefits that might make the waiver request meet the criteria in the growth management in the in the um, in the rate of growth ordinance if um, if we feel it might be able to meet those under certain criteria. The third is to review the cost to serve model um, and you know, emphasize review. We weren't doing an independent full from scratch fiscal impact analysis. We were reviewing the model that the town uses as part of our overall context. And that's important because it's about more than just the fiscal part of this. This is about placemaking. And so I tried to sort of take a holistic approach. Obviously that's one piece of it. Um, and then just to potentially do other tasks as asked by the town. Next slide. So a little bit about our team, I won't dwell on it for long. Um, so uh, my most recent background is I worked as the Planning and Urban Development Director for the City of Portland for seven years. And then before that, I worked in a couple of similar sized communities in the Boston area. Um, but one of the things that I did a fair amount of work on in various communities was exactly what you're doing here, which is trying to really do some land transformation, create a new place. Um, this is very different from putting in a new subdivision or you know, putting in a new store. This is about transforming an area. Um, so for example, the Portland Company Complex in Portland, um, when I worked in Somerville Assembly Square, these are hard things to do and they're complicated. Um, and I actually really enjoy doing them. So thanks for asking me to help with this. Um, my team has two other partners, um, Frank Mahady from FXM Associates um, in Massachusetts. They offer expertise in economic development um, and impact assessment. They really focused on the cost to serve model um, looking at it, offering some comments as part of our overall review. Um, and then Carl Seidman, who is my colleague now at MIT, um, he's actually formerly at MIT, um, I have his old office, and uh, he's worked with a bunch of communities on downtown revitalization. So part of the question was, how important is getting this exemption to creating a successful town center? That's right up Carl's alley. Um, so um, he offered some thoughts on that, and I supplemented them, I'll go over them today. Next slide. So starting off with what's been asked for, um, you know, you may have seen this as part of their presentation. A lot of this is taken from the downs. Um, they've asked for an exemption in the sort of town center area of 90 acres that's, uh, that's in red there. Um, it's about 0.28% uh, of the overall town area. They've asked for an exemption only for dwelling units in mixed use and multifamily buildings, which honestly are probably pretty interchangeable. Probably it will be multifamily if it's in a mixed use building, but that was a specific request. There wasn't a specific number of units. It's about that area um, and you know, the ability to respond to the market. Next slide. 
Um, and then uh, you've seen this, this is the town center concept. Um, and, you know, just a little bit of what the goal is, which is to make this place. And that's different from, again, like I said, putting in a conventional shopping mall or putting in a subdivision. This is difficult, complicated stuff. So it's understandable. There'd be a lot of conversation about it. Next slide. Um, so to back up to a little bit to their request, um, they feel a concentration of housing in the town center is an important anchor that drives customer activity. Um, it will help serve various small businesses, particularly the smaller retail and commercial, not so much the bigger ones, um, which potentially will draw from a larger radius. Um, helping them compete by drawing people into the site, because for example, if you're thinking of going to a coffee shop on Route 1 versus pulling into the Downs, it may need a stronger draw, that's understandable. The placemaking element, which I think is really, as an urban planner, is really important, contributing to the look and feel of the downtown district. Um, helping differentiate and again, create an, a new location, not just another development. Um, appealing to local businesses and their customers and then allowing for a variety of housing types. Um, you know, not just single family, not just multifamily. Next slide. Um, they provided some information about taxable assessed value, which I won't dwell on in details, but this is part of an overall holistic argument about the project. Projects are not just about the positive fiscal ben benefits, but obviously it's a reasonable question as you're sort of leading the town as to what benefits or drawbacks there might be when a development happens. Um, so they've provided some information, which is part of what we looked at, um, that suggests that there'd be a pretty large net increase in the taxable value of this land if it's developed, which, you know, just conceptually doesn't seem unreasonable. Next stop, next slide. Um, again, through going through some of their discussion, um, and then I'll get to sort of our response. Um, estimates of increased tax value. They're looking at by 2028, a $4.7 million tax revenue versus $760,000 now. Um, overall cumulative impact, that's you know, obviously a, a year over year. Um, and then there, that includes um, some of vehicle excise tax and various other sources of income as well. Next slide. Um, again, then they deduct the costs because it's not just, you know, you, know, you get paid taxes, but then you also have to provide services. Um, part of their argument has to do with the idea that the net benefit is significant, that the amount they'll be paying in taxes is much more than the amount of the cost of services. Um, and I'll emphasize, you never know for sure. I mean, you know, I have a lot of conversations about how precise this can be. It's always order of magnitude. It's actually pretty hard in my experience to pull out specific costs for a specific development. But you know, you try to get an order of magnitude and come up with reasonable determinations and make the best decision you can. Next slide. Um, and so really what they're asking for here is specifically just an exemption from the rate of growth ordinance because they already generally have entitlements to this site. Um, so the question was, why do you need that specific item? Um, and it really, to some extent in, in their argument comes down to the idea that um, a lot of the intangible things that will make this town center successful require a faster rate of housing development than would be allowed under the GMO without an exemption. Um, and that also that would contribute to the ability to provide a variety of housing types, um, meet the goals of the comprehensive plan and so forth. Next slide. So pulling back from their sort of, sort of submission and their arguments, um, you know, the primary thing that I focused on and my team focused on when we looked at this was Appendix A um, in the zoning ordinance because the growth management ordinance, the rate of growth ordinance really refers pretty directly to Appendix A. Um, Appendix A is really designed for contract zones. So you kind of have to take the term contract zone out of the, the goals in there or the, the criteria, but they all, they still work. Um, you know, you just replace the idea of the exemption um, with the contract zone. And, you know, you have to come up with a general determination, as you know, that will promote the general welfare in the public interest and have beneficial impacts on the town. Um, which, you know, is, is not uncommon language in these sorts of um, evaluations. Um, you also uh, will need to look at the, the impact on the tax base. And again, that's not the only thing you need to look at, but that is one piece of the puzzle. Next slide. So there's 15 criteria in Appendix A. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go through every single one of them one by one, um, because I think you might, um, you might not appreciate that. It's in my memo. So if you are curious about all 15, I've gone through them, but I, I'm gonna focus for this session on five key criteria. And that's really because the other 10, I think are pretty, pretty likely met by this development. Um, you know, it's a little more nuanced than that in the memo, but 
10 of them are pretty straightforward. There's five of them that are a little more complicated. So I decided to really focus on those five. Um, one has to do with the issue of the tax base um, and what the development will provide in terms of net benefits financially. Um, a second has to do with employment opportunities and the economy of the town in general. The third has to do with a variety of housing types. Um, does it contribute to the, the options that Scarborough residents and other residents have when they come to town? Will it provide recreational, social, or cultural facilities? And then finally, will the development proposed provide goods, services, or amenities desirable for community life? So these five really are, I think, the key, not only to your evaluation, but to their arguments, which is why I think these are the five that it really makes sense to focus on. Next slide. So starting with the tax base impact, and uh, Frank from FXM is, is on Zoom as well. He certainly is uh, the expert on this and can offer his thoughts, but I'll, I'll try to summarize um, for now. Um, we really looked at the uh, cost of service model specifically. Um, we, uh, you know, noticed some things about it that maybe aren't always the same as other fiscal impact models, but there are two or three basic ways of doing this. And I think that generally speaking, it fits within that universe of how you might do these analyses. There's different ways of doing it. And this, this is one of them. Um, you know, the, we didn't really focus on capital costs because in theory, at least impact fees should cover the capital costs, which is actually something that makes Maine great compared to some other states where you might have to also think about capital costs and amortize them. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we noticed on the analysis is that they used correct numbers for school age children in their development um, based on the actual development on the ground. Um, but for a couple of reasons, we still felt those numbers could potentially be low. Um, really has to do with the, how long the development's been in place. So think about how you move to a new home and maybe you're at a certain point in your life, you know, your life sort of journey. And you might be there and then you might say, well, in a couple of years, we might have a kid. Um, so it's hard to evaluate the overall life of a development based on just the first couple of years. Um, and it's not surprising potentially that there were not that many school age kids those first couple of years. Again, these are accurate numbers. They pulled them from the school department, nothing wrong with them. Just offering our thoughts on, on when we look at those specifically. Um, and, and then the other thing I wanted to highlight is there's a lot of sort of, I think a lot of people's gut reaction is more housing means more school age kids, um, which I think sort of makes sense theoretically, but actually there's a lot of evidence that's not nearly as simple as that, especially when you start providing a variety of housing types. So for example, I pulled the numbers for Scarborough and you know, from 2014 to this past school year, enrollments declined by 7.5%, but there's 10.75% more housing units in Scarborough. So clearly it's more complicated than one housing unit has 2.3 kids in it or whatever the number is. And you really need to sort of break it down a little bit. And that's why I think their basic argument that the type of development they're providing will have fewer school-age kids than perhaps other housing in Scarborough is reasonable. Again, we're just not sure whether that number is the right number. It might, it seems like it might be a little low based on a lot of analysis of multifamily housing um, on other studies. Um, I'll let Frank talk more about this if you have specific questions. I suspect the fiscal impact will generally be positive nonetheless, but that's a little outside of our scope. We really were just doing a peer review and offering some thoughts. Next slide. Looking generally at the economic impact that, uh, that I looked at with, um, with Carl, um, you know, we think that consumer spending in this area um, may be a little less than was estimated in their analysis, primarily because of the draw of Portland specifically. So the folks who are to the northeast of here, um, you know, they think about going to the downs versus going to areas in Portland. There's a competing market there that, that may suggest that their overall spending numbers may be a little higher than we would, um, we would expect. I don't think it's an order of magnitude low. I just think it might be a, a tad, a tad high. Um, you know, the other things that really are important, and this is something that, that Carl and I both sort of glommed onto pretty quickly, is that one of the key things to making a place like this a success is sort of institutional draws. So, you know, putting aside the housing argument for a moment, providing reasons for people to come to a place like this. Um, that may not just involve, I wanna to go to that one particular store or restaurant, or I'm gonna go visit my friend. You know, having some institutional draws, cultural, civic, um, seem important to a place like this to succeed. 
Um, and then just generally, I think Carl felt that the accelerating residential development and potentially looking at um, providing some relief from the base numbers in the, in the rate of growth ordinance probably will increase the success of that town center you wanna see. The site may succeed with or without that, but if you really want that town center to have that sense of place, um, you know, his general feeling is that accelerating the residential development would probably be helpful towards that. Um, but equally important would be providing civic and institutional municipal uses on site. So it's not as simple as, okay, so we'll lift the cap and then we're all set. This is complicated stuff. Next slide. Um, variety of housing types, you know, there's over 10,000 dwelling units in Scarborough. Um, there's about 1,300 in buildings of five units or more. It seems pretty clear that this development would increase that number significantly and provide options for people. Um, you know, I was talking to someone today, I think it was actually Frank, um, about the idea that, you know, people tend to be staying in their single family homes longer now than they maybe did 20 or 30 years ago. And by providing options for people, they may not want to stay in that home. They may want to stay in that community and they may not have a place to go in that community. So providing a flat with an elevator that, you know, you don't have to mow the lawn, that may help people get to the type of housing they really want to be in. Um, and generally that's beneficial to both that person and to the community in general. And then the other piece of this has to do with below market affordable housing. You know, I think there are certainly below market affordable housing options on site of the Downs. And I think that does help increase the variety of housing types in Scarborough. Next, um, public recreational, social and cultural facilities. Um, you know, the proposals to uh, potentially include a community center and a school site or a rec center. I'm not saying those are the right answers, but those are the right types of things to be thinking about in a site like this. The types of things that draw someone to a site. Um, and then while they're there, they go to the, the common in the middle, they spend money in the retail stores, they, you know, they, they provide that vitality and, and that energy that really helps make a new place and helps make a new town center. Um, and as part of that, I think that's another piece of what you might need to think about. And there is a connection in my mind between the request for an exemption and thinking about those other elements of their development plan and how to make sure they happen if possible. Next slide. Um, and this is related, the idea of desirable community services, good services and amenities. Um, clearly this town center provides a new community amenity. The town common that's proposed looks great. I think that's the type of thing that, that helps meet this criterion. The smaller scale retail and services are important. Um, the success of those smaller scale retail spaces does seem to be linked to how much develop, housing development happens on site. So if you get more housing earlier in the site, you're more likely to draw um, the types of retail you might have in mind for those small spaces. Um, there is a question about what kinds of uses might fill those commercial spaces and you know, whether, they'll all, whether they'll be chains, whether they'll be independent businesses. I'm, I'm not gonna do a deep dive into that. That is the type of thing that I'm sure they're thinking about. And you know, I think when we think about the success of these types of town centers, we think about a mix of formula-based businesses and independent businesses. So you know, I think that's probably something where everyone's pulling in the same direction. Uh, my re recommendations, um, you know, I, and I've said some of these in passing, but just to put them all on one slide, um, it does seem like developing multifamily housing at a rate higher than the base annual rate in the GMO is likely to substantially increase the chances of success of the town center on site. Um, the proposal is also likely to have a net positive fiscal impact. Um, you know, I can't say that we were 100% convinced that, for example, the number of school age kids they were proposing, but I think the general thrust of their analysis we feel is probably correct. It probably will have a net fiscal impact that's positive on the town. Um, and again, that's only one of several criteria here. So I don't want to sort of focus on it too much, but it's obviously an important thing for, for when you're trying to run a town and buy fire trucks and all that stuff. Um, in terms of thinking about um, if you were to grant an exemption, um, you know, based on Appendix A and based on our analysis, it seems like there could be some conditions that would be appropriate and would tie the two together. And those are the A, B, C, D, and E here. Um, making sure that the broader goals of the creation of a town center are met. Um, providing the development with flexibility to respond to changes in market conditions. So, you know, it might not be helpful to give them an exemption, but say specifically, you can have 72 new units in year one, 54 in year two. You wanna give them some space if you're gonna do this because they're gonna be responding to a variety of conditions in the market. 
Um, I think it's important to have a concept of the town center as an expected outcome. And I don't mean that you condition this on them building it exactly as you heard about um, last time, because I think they need some space as well. But just to make sure that, that the idea is that part of the reason you might grant some sort of exemption would be to get this placemaking element. Um, and I don't have an immediate reaction as to how tightly those two would be tied together, but I think it's important to make that nexus. Um, I do think that although that you should provide some flexibility, it might be worth considering some maximum number of units that are exempt in the subject area. Um, I just think that that's generally a good practice. It doesn't mean they couldn't come back and ask for more, um, but I think that that's probably something I would recommend. Um, and then finally, in order to maximize the public benefits that would be unleashed by potentially granting some sort of exemption, um, things like the provision of the land for civic or municipal purposes um, and how those terms might apply. I think it's great that they're putting aside space for potential community center, potential school. I think buttoning some of that up and buttoning up a little more what it means to provide that land, how long, under what terms, um, are probably relevant to this type of deliberation you're having. I think that might be the last slide. Uh, thanks very much. And also, like I said, uh, Frank Mahady is here on Zoom if there's any questions that really tie specifically into the, into the cost of service model. That was great. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna open it up to the council for questions or uh, reactions to, uh, to what we just heard and saw. It was a lot. But we've been we've been going through it for a little bit now. So. <laughs> I don't think there's any huge surprises there. Yeah. Councilor Johnson. Yeah, back to back to your point where <coughs> where you suggest I use that term just as a note of mention that an accelerated uh, pace of growth will lead to to a success. You know, it it would not ensure success, but it's there's a better, higher probability of success yeah. with an accelerated growth. But that doesn't necessarily mean that this a town center could not be successful without an accelerated growth. Is that correct? Isn't it pure numbers over time or, or what are your thoughts on that? Um, so I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know for sure. My, my general thinking is looking at the rate of growth that's allowed without an exemption. Um, it would be hard to make the investment decisions they'd want to make. There's going to be considerable cost with putting in that town center. And some of the retail decisions you'd like them to make may not be as profitable as ones they could make otherwise. So I, I think it would be challenging to have to, for me to be comfortable saying it will succeed without some sort of exemption. Um, but I don't have a crystal ball. I can't say it wouldn't work without it. You know, my, the, I think the question for me is, do you think it's warranted? And if you want to see that town center succeed, some sort of exemption is probably warranted. Okay, thank you. Councilor Hamill. Yeah, I had a question here uh, in terms of your methodology. I mean, obviously, you know, you're uh, pretty astute in terms of this space and also uh, how you approach things quantitatively. But I was surprised a little bit by uh, your acknowledgement that it's very hard to prove certain things. It's very hard to prove or predict the likelihood for success for a retail uh, you know, retail businesses, uh, you know, that would be included potentially in the downtown. So given that, it, it seems to me that you've sort of like, well, this would meet the community benefit. You're kind of checking the boxes when in fact, shouldn't there be a higher standard? Shouldn't it be that unless they can, unless there's proof, unless we can either demonstrate or there's a clear convincing um, evidence that these things, you know, are required or a prerequisite rather than they're highly correlated with a better chance for success. I just felt you were a little easy in your grading on some of those things, <laughs> saying that they, they, you know, potentially fulfill the requirements of a community benefit. Sure, sure. Um, and fortunately, I don't have to make this decision, you guys do. So, I, but having said that, um, <laughs> I'm looking for a hook for us to hang our hat on. Having right said that, I will say I've worked, you know, I mentioned a couple of these placemaking and land transformation efforts I've worked on. There were others as well, uh, North Point on the Cambridge and Somerville line, um, Brock Row and in, in Westbrook. I've never seen one succeed that had a rate of growth restriction. Yeah. That doesn't mean there isn't a unicorn out there, um, but that's something that I've never seen in any of those. And in fact, that ability to produce a fair amount of housing if warranted quickly has been part of what allows the, them to do the financing and to put in the soft costs to make the place making it succeed. So I don't have a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, 
it's really up to you. I just think I've never, I think it's, it would be, I wouldn't have a case where there was a restriction like this and placemaking succeeded. So related to that, if I might, if I may just ask a follow-on question, on one of your slides you showed um, over time, the costs associated with a, a, a surplus gradually appearing. Could you put that slide up again? It's the blue and gold one. Sure, and to be clear, I think that's the developer slide, but I'm happy Is to, it? yeah, I'm, I'm happy so, to look at it. Yeah, no, it's the other one with the bars, the bar chart. That's the one. That one. Go that, one. that one. That uh, <laughs> one. That one. I think you know the bar. It knows we're talking there about. We it. It's yep, there we go. There we go. So net fiscal benefit. So yep. over time, we're going to have a net fiscal benefit. But the thing I'm struggling with is this concept of proportionality. You know what? What? What are the costs that the town will be bearing, uh, proportionate to eventually obtaining a net fiscal benefit? It does seem to me that it takes a while to get there. And even when you get there, the good gold part of the bar is still a lot smaller than the blue downs cost to the town part of the bar. So is there, should we care about that? Or is it just, uh, we should be happy that uh, they're in the black at that point? Sure. sure. A couple of quick thoughts on that. And again, it's, there isn't a right or wrong answer. That's that's you guys' decision to make, not mine. Um, theoretically, you know, property taxes should cover the cost of services, and there should almost be a one for one. Now, obviously, fiscal planning is a reality. People try to have it so the places provide um, net proceeds. Um, you know, and you know, over time, although it's only maybe a fifth of that bar, that is all essentially theoretically profit to the town if that model is is the one that you follow. The only other thing I would add is that there are a number of communities that will put a no, put a lot of public money into a site before they even see a single dollar of tax revenue. So the Portland Company site, the city paid to extend Thames, Thames Street and put in utilities, and didn't make any didn't get any money for years after that. Um, this is a situation where obviously you're putting credit enhancements, so you're foregoing some of the property tax revenue going forward. But you didn't have to sort of float a bond or do a an area wide. TIF district to put in utilities at, at town expense. So it didn't, it never ran in the in the red. And I view that as something that is noticeable about this development. Okay. Um, I just wanted to add that <laughs> that chart was, it's included in your presentation, but it was the work from the downs. Okay. Right. And then right. also note that if you looked at the town as a whole, um, there's no profit. We spend all our money. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> there'd be no opportunity. Yeah, I noticed that over time. We <laughs> do have that <laughs> habit. Part of what we do. Yeah, so you're, you're just giving me the thing to beat, to beat the drum with. But one, one final question I had is that you had indicated that, particularly as it relates to cost to serve and school impact, that we're, it's a snapshot in time and it shows that there's little to no impact. In fact, that it's, you know, it's much lower than people would expect. But over time, there's, there's a belief, a reasonable belief, I would say, that as people age and as communities age then so too possibly would be their small children who then suddenly do become part they appear uh, as a school impact so is that something that uh, you know right now it looks like it's it's nothing but chances are i mean even am i going door to door and what has been built so far um it does seem there are a lot of kids there that are going to be in school sometime soon in a mm -hmm. couple of years so is there, what's your feeling about the need to do another sweep on analysis to really get a handle on that? Or is that just something that we just save for another day? Sure. So I mentioned earlier, they used a number that I think was correct and matched the reality when they did their analysis. And it was about, I think it was about 0 0.042 school age children per two bedroom as an estimate. Um, you know, the, the work that, that Frank did and that, you know, I've seen sort of puts a general area for a two bedroom unit, it might be between 0.10 or 0.38 kids per, per unit. So that's obviously higher than 0 0.042. It's not 10 times higher or hundred times higher. So, um, so I think that, you know, again, it's not, there isn't a, there isn't a, there will be a difference. It will eat into that yellow bar that you like. Um, my gut tells me it wouldn't eat in to make it disappear. But again, that was outside of our charge. And I, and I think Frank may be able to help here too if he's on the Zoom call. Are you with us, Frank? 
Yes, I am. Excellent. Good to see you all. Likewise. Uh, thanks. Thanks for letting me attend remotely. <laughs> um, yeah, Jeff is absolutely correct that you know we are accustomed to seeing um, more school age kids per unit on average than what the developer presented. Um, again, as Jeff pointed out, he's basing it on the empirical evidence of the actual school age kids that the development to date has produced. Over time, we would expect that um, to increase. Um, is it a fatal or um, decisive difference if we add a higher proportion of school age kids and my, again, this wasn't our charge to do uh, a new physical impact assessment, but my gut sense is it's, it, you know, it will obviously, as Jeff says, lower that goal bar a little bit. I don't think it's going to decisively change a net benefit without having done a more detailed analysis. That's my sense. Thanks. Councilor Paul Johnson. So if we as a council or as a town decide that we want to place make, right? So we want a downtown and, and we want a place where there's civic opportunity and places to gather. Mm -hmm. If we make that value decision, all in, how good of an opportunity is this? Um, there are only a few in Southern Maine, um, again, and they're all a little different, um, but I can think of Rock Row in Westbrook, and I can think of the Portland Company in Portland. Um, in the case of Portland Company, as I mentioned earlier, the city had to spend a lot of money to even make that possible. Um, Rock Row is a little different because it's more commercial. They are talking about doing some residential, but I think this is a pretty unusual opportunity. Um, and you know, as a planner, it, it's an exciting opportunity for the town. Having said that, you know, you're responsible for the well-being of the town in general. So you know, you need to balance those two things. But, but I would say generally, it's a pretty exciting opportunity and, and it would be helpful to make sure that it's successful because you probably won't get another one anytime soon. Council Anders. Yep, so I have, a, I have a few questions. So the first one, Jeff, this might relate a little bit more outside of this particular analysis, but I know you have expertise in housing throughout Maine based on what you've done for GP COG. So according to, our, our data, right? About 13.7% of our dwelling units are in five or more buildings based on the numbers you had in your, your report. I'm just trying to get a grasp on, is that a good percentage for a town or what what is good? Like what's the benchmark <laughs> that we're shooting for that would say adding more housing would be good? Sure. So the only way to really answer that question is would be to do a full housing assessment of what are the residents, where are they in their life sort of span, what about people who would like to live in the community who can't, and to do sort of a housing assessment and get a sense of how the units that you have and the units you want are different. I've done that in a couple of different communities, uh, most recently in Augusta. Um, but, uh, but it's hard to answer that question in the absence of that. I will say that 13.5% is not a bad number for a community like Scarborough, but I also would encourage you that you have a really amazing opportunity to really build on that and provide you know, a variety of housing types for all sorts of Southern Maine residents, particularly as the Portland market is so strong. Um, and that, and that, you know, that number could go higher. I, there's no right or wrong number and I don't have a full analysis to suggest that, but, but I think an opportunity for more multifamily in Scarborough, in my opinion, is a good one from a planning perspective. Okay. Um, but I can't give you a more precise number than that. Okay, well, that, that, that's helpful just to get, get that, that perspective. Um, when it comes to, to the retail, again, like my, my takeaway when I read it, and you kind of talked about it a little bit, and, I, and I'll be honest, when, when the Downs shared their, their map last time, I told them I was a little underwhelmed. It was hard mm -hmm. for me to picture how that level of retail would actually be, you know, a place I would go to or that many people I know would go to. And so when I read your report, it kind of made me feel like even that felt a little optimistic. And so... I'm just trying to gauge like what's realistic in terms of what's feasible and and is this really going to be a place for community making as much as we want it to be or is that that like very like from your perspective like what's the probability that that's going to happen sure sure and i think there's 
I mean, first off, it's important to note it's a concept plan. And although I said earlier, you want to make sure they do something conceptually like that, ideally they do something like at a whole nother level. And I, and, I, and I think that will be driven largely by the market. They're not going to build retail space they don't feel they have tenants for. Um, I think that the three things that would really allow it to be all it can be, one is housing on site. And obviously that's, we've been having a long discussion about that. The second is the sort of institutional draws, whatever they may be, it could be a, a private place. It could be a public place. It could be a combination. It could be a school. It doesn't have to be any one of those. But things that draw people to the site, whether or not they want to spend money. And then finally, the success of a really well-designed public open space mm -hmm. that's not just, you know, a lawn that gets mowed every, every, every couple of weeks that has things that make people come to it. And I think of on a huge scale, I think of Millennium Park in Chicago, where there's that huge bean and people come from all over it because they want to see the bean. Now, obviously, that's <laughs> not that's not the same as the scale here. But the idea of like, there's fun stuff there. Let's go to that park as opposed to, hey, it's a park. It's nice for the people who live there, but it doesn't really draw people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of what I've seen from their presentations about thinking through that park is interesting. I think, again, it's somewhat related to how much the rest of the site succeeds, how much they feel they can spend on that, because I don't think they're making money off of anything on that park. Yeah. So, 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 so just to kind of dig deeper in, in your comment about the relationship between housing and institutional draws and how they're both needed. Like, can, can one happen before the other? Can we do the institutional things first? Would that be feasible for them to do that first before doing the housing? Or does housing have to come first? Or can they happen in parallel? Like, what's Sure, sure. Um, I think the advantage of housing is that you can take it to the bank. Um, if you have a mixed use development and you say, I want to do this I want to provide this space for a community center and I want to do this retail and I want to do this office and I'm going to do the supermarket. If you have housing in a market as strong as the greater Portland region, banks will say, hey, now we're talking. <laughs> now we can loan you money. So I do think that the housing is important just from a practical perspective. If I could wave a magic wand and say, produce the whole thing, but maybe not as much housing, it's hard to say. But I do think it all kind of comes as a package. Mm -hmm. So it's not to me, it's not one or the other. Places that are just institutional draws um, have times when it's pretty empty. Um, you know, I think of like the Rose Kennedy Greenway in Boston, which is great during the day when there's offices that are full. And at night, it feels a little empty because there isn't a lot of housing near there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they both sort of help serve for the success of a location like this. Okay. And for the schools, the school question that we keep going back to, and tell me if I'm just being paranoid and maybe taking this a step too far. <laughs> sure. I feel like I might be. But when I think of the analysis we've done around the schools, again, we're very much looking at the downs itself and, and what's going to be in the downs. And I, I keep thinking of the fact that those 1,000 or 600, whatever the number is, those might be people migrating out of our single family homes mm -hmm. into the community, yeah. which those will get filled potentially with families and kids that we're not really accounting for. Am I being paranoid and thinking that that we're missing that layer of impact to the schools in our analysis as we're thinking about this, this growth. Because again, that's adding 10% to our housing potentially. Sure. People are going to migrate and what's going to happen in those vacant homes. Yep. Yep. And I've heard that this I've heard that argument before. So you're not being you're not being paranoid. Okay, good. Um, I think I have a little bit of a twofold response. One, I know that some, I said earlier that some people maybe stay in a house longer than they perhaps want to because they don't have alternatives. But there's definitely people that are moving anyways because at some point they just have to. Um, the other part of it is a little less sort of directly tied into the school question, a little more, do we really want to force people to stay in a house that's too big for them to keep there for being school-age kids in that house? And I, I'm just, I'm not, a, personally, I'm not comfortable with that. That's a judgment call, but allowing people to go to the place they want to be. And it may mean that more kids come into a residential neighborhood. Um, but that's kind of what cities and towns are about to yeah. me. So. Yeah. And then um, next question. So, and, and the analysis that I think your partner did, that was more about financing. I, I think I understand what you said about how getting, um, getting, financing to support housing is going to be much easier. But is it still impossible to pursue other means of financing? Do we need to rely on the housing? I get the housing will be easier. Sure. But 
does that mean it's impossible or can they still get financing via other more traditional methods? Well, I think it's harder. Um, and I think what you will see is larger footprint retail spaces that have these grade A national tenants, um, as opposed to the types of places you might wanna see next to your neighborhood park, which are smaller scale, maybe can't, aren't as bankable, but add to that intangible feeling of a community. Um, so I think you look at a site like the Downs and, and if you start just with a blank slate and say, hey, can you make this work without housing? Sure, they could. They probably just fill it with large footprint retail and office buildings. But if you want to get smaller scale, more sort of fine textured development, that's not as bankable. Mm -hmm. And that needs something else that gets the bank's attention. And again, that's just my opinion. But, you know, I think I've seen it succeed in other places, too, where you, you almost have these lost leaders of these little ice cream stores and bookstores. And then you have the thing that really makes the money. Um, and you kind of need both for places to succeed. Yeah. So, so my last question is, you've said a couple of things, and I'm not trying to put Put words in your mouth but sure. the way you described what we're trying to do is complex and unusual which to me equates to risk and i think this ask is asking us to put a lot of risk on the town so if you if you had to look at this from where the risk sits in terms of the town versus the downs in terms of making this work how much of it is falling on us and is it high risk, moderate risk? Like what's your assessment on the risk that, that's being placed on us versus the reality of this actually coming to fruition? Sure, I mean, I think compared to other land transformations I've seen, the amount of risk being taken on by the town here is fairly low, honestly. Okay. Um, what I've seen is when I worked in Somerville and Assembly Square, we had a steel manufacturing facility. We had a, a mall that had a store, a Kmart that had a 50 year lease at a dollar per year that we couldn't get rid of, even though it was really antithetical to our goals there. The city had to do a lot of risk taking. They had to create an urban renewal area. They had to name acquisition parcels. They had to come up with the money to buy them. Um, there was a chance that would all fall flat in its face and not succeed at all. all you're, what you're taking on as a risk profile is a lot lower and it's not zero, um, but it's a lot lower in my opinion than a lot of these. Great, thank you. Council Council. Just, uh, same threads. It's, right now, if we look at the downs, we have a pretty heavily developed south end that's lots of multifamily units, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have a nice light industrial area. If we, what's the what's the risk of of not of not doing this, right? So, is there a risk of the current property values in in the in the established units being depressed and perhaps in perhaps creating an area that isn't vibrant? Like, is there there's, there, there's risk of doing it. I'm starting, I'm wondering, is there a risk of not doing it? Are mm -hmm. we, are we, is it, would be a self-fulfilling prophecy of more kids, depressed property values, if we decided to go a rate that, to, to take a course of action that might, let's say, make the group. Sure, you know, sure, you know, sure. You know, you know, yeah, know. yeah. I think the risk of not doing it, and again, I haven't had conversations with the development team about this, so I'm just thinking, hey, if I own this, um, what are my options? I think the biggest risk might be that that middle area that could have the town center could just become a standard single family subdivision that meets all the requirements of the town and can be phased with, in accordance with the existing rate of growth ordinance. And I don't think that would mean the other pieces would fail necessarily, because I think that they could stand on their own potentially. But I think that's, that's a possibility. They have the, I think they have, as far as I can tell, they have the ability to do that. And you know, that is a low risk option for both them and for the town. Um, you know, from a planning perspective, I think generally what's proposed, and we've talked a lot about the details, but generally what's proposed is more exciting and more interesting and will make Scarborough a better place. Having said that, you know, subdivisions are fine. I don't have any big problem with them, but I don't think necessarily that those two pieces would get entirely dragged down if you didn't do this, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm asking. Yeah. Thank you. I think you might see a different middle and you may not like what you see in the middle. Right, okay, yep. Council Anderson and then Katarina. Yeah, no, I think, I think, I don't know if I quite have a question, but more like what, what we see in the middle, I guess, I think that's just the question that we all need to kind of think about is, is what Jeff described as what may be worst case of some single family homes there instead of this really that bad. I mean, I don't know. I think that's something we have to think about. I will say, I think it would probably have a lower fiscal benefit and potentially a fiscal loss, but 
but houses are for people. I'm not necessarily opposed to, you know, having a fiscal impact. I just think that's a fact that, you know, large single family homes are more likely to have more kids. Councilor Katarina. Yeah, Jeff, um, thank you for doing all this work. It's, oh, sure. uh, I find it very interesting. Um, I, and this is gonna sound like a really dumb question, but there's no such thing as dumb question in my world. Um, could you, for the purposes of both uh, the council and for the public, define what we mean, what is meant by retail in your world? Because I think that word sometimes gets misused or, or brings up uh, concepts for people that aren't necessarily accurate. So I sure. know, if I'm putting you on the spot. Let me no, 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 not at all. I mean, it's a very broad term. It can mean anything right. from you know, a little corner store or a bookstore all the way up to a Walmart. I mean, those are all retail. I think that there's a broad area there. And that's one of the reasons why I was highlighting, you can show retail on a plan and it may mean different things depending on how much money a developer wants to make from it, how much they want to be able to borrow against it. It's really easy to borrow money if you, want to, if you bring Walmart in as a tenant. Um, it's a lot harder if you bring in the corner bookstore and the coffee shop, unless it's a Starbucks. And even then it's probably not quite as, as profitable. So retail can mean any number of those things. And that is one of the things I'd encourage you to think about is what kind of retail do you, do you wanna see if you're going to invest in a town center like this? And is it something that they can do? Because also you can't imagine something successful when it's not. And that's where I think they need to be responsive to the market. And to some extent, the more they can rely on the residential, the less they'll be concerned about making every last dollar off their retail. And, and as follow up to that, um, I know in planned communities that I'm familiar with, um, well, the one I'm most familiar with is Daniel Island mm -hmm. in uh, Charleston. Oh, yeah. In Charleston. And um, offices. You know, when you talk about offices, I mean, it's not just big offices. You can have a dental office. You can have yep. a, law, a law office that's two people or whatever. Sure. So it, that's considered separate from the retail, right? Yeah, that wouldn't be retail. That would be more service or, or, okay. or commercial space. And I think there is some of that proposed in their plan as well. Yep. And perhaps in upper stories. Um, and I but think that's. It may, but it may make sense having it in, scattered throughout this so called downtown. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you, you know, if, if there's a certain number of people living on site, it would be great to have a dentist people could walk to. Right. And that might be in a ground level space. That's fine. But that's not retail necessarily. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure. Councillor Johnson. Yeah, Jeff, thanks. Definitely, thanks for doing this. It's uh, it's well done. And uh, th this section in here is probably from the downs, but it's in your presentation. So at the moment, you own it. <laughs> uh, under the public benefits, according to the applicant, not possible with a limited exemption. I was wondering because uh, I'm sure that you you had discussions. Uh, I'm sure there's you can't share everything, but you've had, sat down and had discussions with them. Can you uh, address number two? Uh, that without the limit, without the exemption, they could not address the townwide transportation improvements? Sure. So they have a, a TMP from, from Main Dot that has a pretty significant bill associated with it for transportation improvements. Um, if they were to move forward with a lower level type of development or a less intense development, they would probably revisit those commitments and probably would not be making some of those commitments some of which would be needed because of their development, but honestly, some of it is a little above and beyond that and fixes existing problems because that's how TMPs tend to work. So I think that's what they're referring to there, but, but like you said, ideal to them, that was their argument, not necessarily mine, but I think there's some validity to it. Thank you. Okay, so I, I can't talk without quoting some numbers, so. <laughs> I, I want to start up going up. <laughs> no, oh, I'm not okay. gonna. I'm not gonna have you pull it up. Uh, okay, so we've talked about the impact of kids, right? And and it's a concern. It's a natural concern. Um, when I look at over the past decade, we, we've increased our housing stock by twenty percent. Our school enrollment's gone down about five percent. Um, our median age has gone up almost eight percent. What I kind of see, we're 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 growing, but we're 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 growing disproportionately is what it feels like to me, or, or that's what I'm seeing in the data. Um, my impression is that some, a development like this could help us to achieve maybe a better balance. And maybe that will mean, we, you know, we have more kids in our schools is 
as long as we're not overcrowding them, I'm okay with that. Can you speak to some of these dynamics? I, I know that um, the demographic trends in Scarborough are, you know, while it's great that we're growing, they're, they're a little concerning to me at the same time mm -hmm. in that, um, you know, it, the ratio of working people or people working age to seniors has dropped 25% in the past mm -hmm. decade. Right. That is huge. Uh, so I help us. Help sure. Me. I mean, I, I think it's not surprising that being so close to Portland, your housing value is going up. And that's part of why the population is aging because someone who bought their house in 1990 and has a fixed rate mortgage can stay. If, you, if you're a young family and you have two kids and you're thinking about having a third, and you look at what a house costs in Scarborough versus in Standish, you know, you're gonna look, you're, you're gonna be pretty tempted to go to a place like Standish where you can get twice as much house. So I think that's part of what's what's driving this. And that's why I did find the affordable elements in this development to be a nice piece of what Scarborough could benefit from. It doesn't solve the problem, but it provides another option. Um, but there are larger trends at work. Americans are having fewer kids. Americans are living in bigger houses. So some of this is beyond you. Um, but I do think that kids are about more than just making or losing money. And, and that's something I always try to sort of reiterate. You know, it's not, it, it, it's, it's, it's an important piece of a successful community. And yes, it may cost a little more, but, but I think it's also an important part of a dynamic mixed community. And so are seniors, so are single people who don't have a family. It's all part of what makes a place interesting and exciting. Thank you. Well, I, I just, you know, the numbers are important, John, that you just mentioned, and I, I, I agree those are, those are insightful. But, but one thing I learned recently on the, the school committee is that there's 31 trailers in our school today. So our infrastructure is really poor. This, this would be mostly kids going to, depending if they're younger age, going to eight corners, which is the worst of all of the schools right now that need work. 10 kids, which might not be, might be the downs number, is not a number that the town, I think, could absorb right away. So I think that's that's the reality is like, even though the number might be small, even if it declines, I still think we have this, this crisis with our infrastructure, with the schools that, you know, puts our, our education at risk. And so I think that's something else we got to think about, not just the growth and decline, but like, what's the real impact today of the current situation, which, you know, we need to kind of dig into a little bit more with the schools where I still don't feel like we have a very good school absorption plan that we could tie along with this. Whatever, whatever the actual growth rate is aside, I still feel like we need a school absorption plan. As he usually does, Councillor Anderson took all my best talking points. Mm -hmm. um, but it, when it comes to the school, you know, one thing that we need to keep in mind as a community is that all growth is not created equal. These kids are not, you know, coming in at our phase levels, you know, spread out evenly across the entire district and to John's point, you know, they, that district right now is eight corners um, and it is overcrowded. Um, and then, you know, we add this layer of complexity where, you know, a few years ago when we were looking at our enrollment numbers, we were surprised to find that a lot of our enrollment was coming from older neighborhood turnover. And so then when we start talking about, you know, is this going to mean people like my parents, my in-laws are going to downsize and be able to buy something in the downs. Well, they live in sweet little houses, you know, where I, a young family would love to live there. And so, you know, how do we balance and even begin to project the impact? And then, and then again, I, I'm all for having more children in the district. I think that's wonderful. So we need to be able to plan for it. And so this is certainly not a like, oh, we got to stop this all these young kids from coming to the district, but my primary charge I think is to plan for that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm having a hard time even wrapping my head around where we would even begin to be able to assess what the actual impact of this is gonna be with enough time for the town to make sure that we have our infrastructure in place. A comment, not a question. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, yes. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> Councilor Hamill. Yeah, I had a one, just one kind of parting thought here as opposed to parting shot. Um, and that is, um, you know, you hear, hear this saying that just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it, okay? So the feeling that I keep getting over and over again is that we are in this business, okay? We as a council, we as a public are in the growth and development business, like it or not, okay? We, 
you know, that deal was made and it's, you know, we're living it. So what's your opinion on um, these things that are, that are pending, you know, community center, a uh, place for a school, a, uh, a downtown. Um, we can't do them all, you know, maybe we can over time, but we need to make some choices. What's your advice based upon what you've seen here uh, in terms of helping us to, to focus and move forward? Sure. I mean, as I understand it, Scarborough has planned for this type of development to occur on the Downs for a while. It was, it was in the comprehensive plan. It certainly was in um, the zoning. So the town has laid the groundwork for this type of project for a while. It's not, to me, it's not unreasonable that they say, let's make sure that we can do what we want to for it to succeed now. And that may involve additional actions. Again, it's really up to you, not me. But my thought is if you bring in a development team and you have them make investments based on a certain set of plans, it, it's not unreasonable that they might ask for things that make it as potential to be as successful as possible. Um, on the flip side, there's things that the, that the town's interested in, you know, whether or not you're interested in the school site, I'd yield to the school board and to you guys on, but you know, that's, that's a, that's a nice public possibility. Um, a community center, seems great if that's something that you are interested in and, and can do on a site like this, it would be a good location for it. Um, and those might add to what came in those plans five or 10 years ago. Um, but it's not like they just showed up yesterday and said, we're gonna build this. It's, they clearly read your plans, made investments, and they've moved along in the process in good faith um, for what it's worth. So just one final question, and I, I apologize, this is a pointed one, but what's your feeling and based on your experience of us moving forward with the development team of the Crossroads Holdings as the developer, okay? Um, and we've referenced a number of other examples of, of towns nearby where, you know, we, we talk about Rock Row all the time, mm -hmm. where they have a development partner, partner is very sophisticated, you know, a national presence, access to capital markets, and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you feel? If you were us, how would you feel about that? Sure. Well, they've done everything they said they were going to do so far, as far as I can tell. And to me, that's worth something. Um, I can't say for sure. You know, I, I'm only become familiar with them recently. There are, there are teams nationally with deeper pockets. On the other hand, this is a community-based team, which is also valuable. So I don't, I, I, I think they've done what they've been said they were going to do. They've been pretty honest about it. And they seem to have a strategy to make things happen that you want to see happen. But ultimately, I think it's up to, to you guys and to the development team, not me. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. I don't, I don't have a question for you, I don't think. But I might have a question for Tom based on something you said <laughs> that I wrote down. So um, so you you made a, a comment, I think, about impact fees and how you how I think we're in a position where impact fees will address some issues, but I know we have a goal to reevaluate our impact fees, which tells me there may be a gap that maybe that assertion you made, we still need to do some work to make sure that that's true. And so I guess my question is, 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 is what my, my take on that is that, is that a, a fair take to say, we still have some work for impact fees to make sure those get adjusted to make sure that the, the things those are intended to address get addressed appropriately. I'll be honest, I'm not very familiar with our impact fees right now and where the opportunities are. So I don't know what the scope of that is, but I, I get the sense that there's a need to update them. This huge project is coming. Do we need to update them before we make any agreement? Or again, would that need to be a something we would talk about that would be um, tied into this somehow? Uh, we certainly freely admit that the impact fees need to be revisited and, and updated. Um, by my estimation, Scarborough has a fairly robust uh, array of impact fees by main standards. Um, we are limited, we're authorized, but also limited through state law in terms of what we can impose. And so, um, you know, and, and that's been true for the last several decades, 20 years at least. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't expect that there'll be a huge gap. I'd like to think it's fairly seamless. We'll keep those in place. We did disband uh, a number of traffic impact fees in the Payne Road area. So that's a bit of a gap. Um, but of course their TMP speaks to the next three to five years. So I think, I think we're safe in that regard. So I really don't, that work is underway on the traffic side. Uh, I think that could be a seamless transition. I see us repealing one 
uh, one night and replacing the same night, frankly. Uh, so I, I don't have that fear whatsoever. Um, with the school impact piece, <clears throat> uh, we haven't dug into that yet. I don't, in, I don't expect, and we saw this in the Downs presentation, that you know, we, we charge impacts for one bedroom units, which we know pretty well that there's not much of an impact there. So I think modernizing those fees might create a differential that, that's not gonna hurt them, I, or I, it might save them money and, and you know, act against single family homes is mm. where I expect that might end up. Um, but I don't, I, I don't think it's gonna be a drastic shift overall. I think at the time those were created, you were planning for um, high school or you know, some other major capital um, investment. And that's kind of the situation that we're in today. Yeah, the school impact fees are a, a good one to talk about. They've grown over years, uh, over the years. They're, there's a built-in escalator. I think it's a 3% escalator per year. So they've arguably kept up with inflation, but they're based on antiquated projects that uh, some of which don't exist. Or actually, some of them probably still exist, unmet needs. Uh, but we need to freshen those up and have them actually relate to tangible projects. I mean, that's the key to impact fees that the they have to have some rational basis. Uh, they have to be based on an actual project and project costs, and then assigning relative uh, you know, uh, impact, if you will, from a particular developer. Right. <clears throat> Councilor Johnson. While you're here, Jeff, <laughs> I, I'm struggling with, uh, the, the ask is for an exemption of our GMO. Our GMO is based on an annual allocation of number of units built in the town. Uh, I'm struggling with how to even start the conversation if I don't know what the request of the numbers on the other side of the equation is. So I was wondering if you can help me with that. Am I, am I putting too much value in numbers? Because again, that's, that's the core of what the GMO is, it's numbers, you know, the, the, the types and all that's planning. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you have a conversation with a party, negotiate with a party, and, and you can't get part of the equation into the conversation. Guide me. Sure, and I and I know they have some order. Of, they did present some numbers at their at the um, at some point in terms of what they generally had in mind. I think you have to ask them how many. You know, you've asked for a general exemption. We'd like to put a number to it. So, what number are you asking for? I would suggest you don't ratchet it down to the specific number of units too tightly. You want to give some wiggle room because let's say you give them an exemption for X units and they can get great financing, but they need to do 10 more. You don't want to have them. Right. So you give them a little wiggle room, but I, I don't think it's unreasonable to say how many, how many units are we talking about here? So, okay. and I'd ask them that, not me. <laughs> I, I had a question. I just want to follow up uh, the presentation. I presume you were able to, to watch the presentation that the, the Crossroads consultants made that started to provide some yep. better vision as to the town center. Uh, one thing that, and, and maybe I heard it wrong or I, I'm reading into, into it too much, but the consultant, uh, Brian, I forget, well, I forget his name, Brian, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, he struck me to have good, you know, national, maybe international perspective kind of on these things. And what uh, he seemed to convey a thought that this project was unique in his experience based on kind of the institutional uh, and civic components of the town vision, the town center vision. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else heard that or that was just me. I wondered if you could have any opinion uh, about that. Is that unique or do we have something unique in front of us here? I don't think it's necessarily unique. I've definitely seen projects that didn't have a civic piece. And then I've seen ones that maybe didn't have initially, but as they succeeded in the later phase, they said, well, now we need to build a school or, you know, whatever. Um, I've seen ones that have draws like a, so like a, like a regulation size soccer field. I mean, that can be a draw as well. So I'm not sure I agree that it's unique. I think it's not, it doesn't always happen. I, I think it's an important part of these types of developments because I think it makes them more organic. Um, but, uh, but I've definitely seen some without it. They often had some other major thing that drew you, you know, in the Portland company site, you have these historic buildings that have been there and you have the waterfront. Um, in Assembly Square, you had a new MBTA station. So there's some sort of draw. Um, it may not be sort of civic or municipal in the same way, but that, there's always an angle. There's always a reason why a site's successful. In Rock Row, I think the quarry is what's going to draw people to that site. So there's always something. 
I mean, that's what I think the, str the struggle is going to be for council is that it's tempting and we try to kind of quantify as much we can to really get to the numbers, whether it's the financial numbers or the units. And uh, But there's a there's a, an intangible, this yeah. whole qualitative piece that, you know, I see a lot of heads nodding as these conversations have happened over the last several months. And how do we assure that that vision can be a reality? Because I, it strikes me that's an important part of this equation. Good point. Well, and I think that goes to the first question I asked Jeff is, you know, fundamentally, do are we placing value on this? I think it, it wouldn't hurt to say yes or no at this point and then move forward because perhaps some of us up here don't want this to succeed. And if that's the case, I think that should be vocalized amongst us and then proceed accordingly, right? I mean, if if Jeff's alternative alternative plan of, you know, hey, these guys get 42 units, right? So these guys can build 42 single family homes in the middle of the downs and they can do that for the next 10 years and they can have 420 single family units. If that's if that is something that the council is okay with, I think I think we need to be start being a little more vocal with the public and each other, because we need to we need to move beyond that point. We need to make a value decision of do we want this? I think I think by and large we do, but I could be. Wrong. I thought uh, just a point of order. I thought yeah. that's what uh, part of the purpose of an executive session was. I'm just making I'm just doing yeah. rhetoricals. Yeah, I, I think I'm allowed to. Right, so. Well, yeah. I just then, yeah. but that's just I'm just trying to clarify my right, understanding right. of the agenda. Right. Right. But so, I'm full. I'm very happy in the next twenty minutes to start wading into that. No problem. <laughs> so, fair enough. I, you stole my thunder a little bit. I did. Uh, it, we do have an executive session planned later, and I expect everybody will, uh, assuming we adjourn into one, uh, we'll we'll speak freely there. So but, do we have your answer because <laughs> that we can that saves that time. <laughs> Rock and roll. <laughs> Can, can, can I add a can I can I add a rhetorical though to his rhetorical? <laughs> sure. Yeah, well, well, just more more like to, to Paul's point, like as we we look at this from a value based perspective, which I think is important and a good question to be asking ourselves. I think we also have to be asking ourselves: Can we get and achieve those values in other ways outside of this particular project? Because I think at least for me, the values are there, the values I definitely want. For me, it's still a question mark of, can we get those in other means that, that aren't as much risk to the town? And that's still a question mark I have. So I think that's something I would also ask people to think about too. So this is part of the, what I wanted to draw some attention to. It's where we are in the process right now. We've been talking about it for a number of months, so it's not like we haven't done any work, but I don't think we're at the finish line. And I think that's important for everybody to, to understand. And I don't think um, and I wanted to ask this to, to the council. I don't think anybody supports approving what was presented to us, what has been proposed for an exemption. And I want you to speak up if you do, because I, I'm going on my perception. Uh, at, at the same time, I don't think there's anybody that wants to bring it to a vote and say no, because I think we all see opportunity here to make something work. And I'm also, you know, if, if you disagree with that, it's okay to say so, because I don't want to waste anybody's time. Uh, so th this is kind of the cue. This is the next step for us is to, well, let's air some of the concerns and things that we don't know or questions that we have. And let's see if we can find a, 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 you know, something that makes us all at least reasonably comfortable, maybe not fully comfortable um, because there is some risk and there's certainly a lot of risk on the developer. Um, and I, that, I think that'll be a neat challenge to, to, to try to bring all of our kind of collective wisdom, if you want to call it together and see if we can come up with something that's palatable. And I also think just from a timing standpoint, and I'm being deadly serious now, that it does take time for us to absorb what we've heard this evening, for us to have some discussion about this. Certainly we'll do it at length in public when we've had uh, hopefully an opportunity for some consensus or not, and then we'll move forward with that. So and we've had a good, good track record. With that. I think that's a, an important point as well is but right now we have nothing to respond to other than what was proposed to us. We need to Put something together that we can read the public can read they can tell us they like it don't like it and we can have those same um kind of feelings and i i think that would all be part of the process assuming we're able to get there no okay that's my spiel we uh I, jeff do you have any closing comments or any other questions or from the council or uh we're going to open it up to the public as well no, no, I mean, I just, just the only thing to think about in terms of timing is uh, time is money for a development. So, you know, I, I, 
it's again, you'll do what you will and it's fine. I just, that is a factor in terms of um, how, how they're going to think about what they want to do with their site as well. So, but thank you very much. I really appreciated this and thought some great comments. Really enjoyed it. That's good, Castle. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Um, does anybody in the public want to uh, add comment? We're nearing the end of the session. I, I see a couple of hands up remotely. Anybody in the room here? Good. Okay. Um, who is that? Uh, Marvin, you are up. Hi, it's Mr. Marvin. Gates. It's Marvin Gates, 423 Black Point Road. Uh, I heard a very informative. Uh, thank you very much for having this. Uh, I heard the consultant uh, say two things toward the beginning, and that those are that the ch their charge did not include, and please correct me if I'm wrong, a net benefit analysis, nor did it include a housing assessment. And I was wondering whether or not the council thought or whether the consultant thought those might help. Uh, obviously, there's a cost involved. And secondly, uh, I'm going to squeeze another one in here. It does. This is a comment. It does sound to me as though the institutional draw is the fulcrum on, on which this hinges. And the consultant again said, there should be some ability, if not to demand, at least negotiate the kind of institutional, kinds of institutional draws. And my bugaboo is, and the consultant said it when he spoke about Chicago and the Bean, and of course, Scarborough, we're not at that scale. But I do think scale is, and I've said this before, is, is key to define. And the way I define it is it was exciting to think of something such as the old grandstand being there. That's, that has a scale. And the proposed replacement for it has another scale, a smaller scale. And uh, somewhere in between or some scale conversation, I think, is important about the institutional draw. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marvin. I'll allow you to comment on his initial questions where do you think we would benefit from, uh, I think a, a comprehensive housing study for the town or a more refined cost to serve um, analysis? I may have misparaphrased that. Sure, and I may be speaking against my own self-interest here. Um, I'm not sure that you need to really go much further on fiscal impact. And um, I just think that, that that's only one factor here and you have some data on it. Um, you could probably gather some more, but I think there's only so far that's going to inform a difficult decision you're going to make. Um, in terms of housing needs, I think it's always helpful to do a townwide housing needs assessment. I'm not sure that's necessarily 100% needed to make this decision because I think there is, I think there's a sense, my feeling is this variety of housing will benefit the town. If you want to do a townwide assessment, that's a different sort of bugaboo and I'd be happy to bid on that, <laughs> but that's a separate thing. <laughs> Would you give so, us a good deal? So maybe. Um, so those are my initial reactions. Um, uh, Eamon Dundon. Sorry, I'm having trouble seeing the screen. I, I think it says Eamon, Eamon Dundon. Yeah, not, not a problem. Thank you, uh, counselors. Uh, my name is Eamon Dundon, and I'm the director of advocacy at the Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce. Um, we represent about 1,300 businesses in eight communities in greater Portland, including uh, just over 100 in Scarborough. And I'm here tonight to, to speak in support of the, the request from the Downs and to comment a little bit on, on Jeff's um, great analysis of the data provided thus far. Um, you know, we find that the request from the Downs is well supported by both their own consulting team and, and the work that, that Jeff did. The, the Levine report notes that nearly all of the criteria um, laid out as standards for granting exemption are met with some additional information and, and guarantees to be worked out. Um, just a little bit bigger picture, you know, we hear from our members that the largest impediment to economic growth and workforce development is a shortage of affordable, safe, and convenient housing. Um, that's in proximity to good paying jobs, transportation and community amenities with increased labor shortages leading to supply chain challenges and inflation. Um, it's never been more important to create more housing and, and this exemption would allow the downs to do just that. 
I would note that in in a recent survey of residents in Scarborough, which I, I read, you achieved you know high marks across the board, which was you know very well deserved. But only 19% of residents reported satisfaction with the availability of affordable housing, with 45% of residents reporting they are dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with the availability of affordable housing. Those opinions aren't unique to Scarborough, but they are addressable through actions you can take to approve this exemption, increase supply, create more housing opportunities. Just historically, if you think about Maine and New England, um, lots of towns have developed around dense, walkable town village and village centers that featured all sorts of housing options, from single family homes to row houses to two to four unit apartment buildings, and finally much larger multifamily developments. If you think about Portland's Old Port or the small fishing communities that dot our coast or the mill towns along our rivers, mixed, dense, uh, mixed use and dense walkable urban clusters evoke positive feelings for many and reflect some of the most economically dynamic periods of our state history. Um, I, I think it's abundantly clear that the commercial components of this development will not be viable unless significant housing development takes place. So if that's the direction you want to go, I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, the, the reason for this exemption um, is to enable a downtown that goes beyond just housing and beyond just retail to create a, a complete town center that expands the town of Scarborough's tax base considerably. And to look at the housing in a vacuum separate from the other amenities proposed may lead to an assumption that does not fully recognize the complete public benefit, I think, that's on the table here. Finally, you know, sprawling single-use shopping centers, uh, like Jeff noted, represent the built development patterns of the past 70 years. But more and more around our state and the examples that were mentioned tonight and, and around the country, we're seeing renewed efforts to return to the built environment of the hundreds of years before that, that allow for really true economic vitality. So thank you for your time tonight. You know, I look forward to watching the discussions of this council in the near future on this item. I would just note on, on a personal note, I'm from Portland and uh, I first got involved in this stuff um, with that Portland company project that Jeff mentioned. And that was about uh, eight or nine years ago. And that was my first, you know, sort of involvement in municipal government in, in our region. And, and I just want to say that you couldn't have picked a better consultant than Jeff to do a project like this. Um, Jeff did an amazing job for the city walking through that very complex project. And, uh, and it, you know, it's taken a while to get that project off the ground, but it's finally moving and, and delivering real economic benefit to the town. So I just had to, had to end with that final note. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Mr. Freeman. His bid just went up. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Are. I'm sorry I can't be there in person tonight, um, but uh, I read the report. I'm, I'm out on uh, Broad Turn Road on Sterlingwood Drive. I'm part of the sprawl that came to Scarborough 20 something years ago. And I came from Northern Maine and you know, I mean, Scarborough's, Scarborough's an economic hub in the state of Maine. And, you know, we're an aging state. We need workers. You know, we, we need companies that are vibrant. We have IDEX now coming to town. I think that's the quietest major economic impact in, in Southern Maine. And you just don't hear that much about it, that we'll, we'll have a hundred workers coming to the downs in the first phase. And, and that's life sciences, which is the manufacturing of the future. You know, I, I, I thought Jeff's report kind of spelled out that a, a lot of the reasons why. And I certainly understand why the council will want to, you know, look through it and, and, and talk it out. Um, but I, last night, I watched Major League Baseball, who started talking, what, two years ago? And then in December, the owners had a lockout. And then they didn't come to an agreement. And now baseball season's not going to start on time. My hope is that the council will sit down and look at everything and then come to a decision in a timely manner, you know, after you've discussed everything that you need to discuss. But don't leave us late, uh, leave us waiting for first pitch. That's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. Well said, Mr. Friedman. <laughs> Any other members of the public would like to comment on uh, this workshop? Okay. Oh, we do have one. Uh, Ms. Hamill. Can you hear me? Can. Um, it's Susan Hamill. And um, 
I live in on Bay Street in Pine Point. Um, my my main concern uh, with the project is how do we how can we guarantee that if we give an exemption to the GMO and they start building hundreds of apartment units, how can we guarantee that the amenities that the downtown will actually be completed? You know, we are in a, you know, expanding an economy. There's the business cycle is real. Um, we don't know how long this expansion will last, but I'm concerned that um, it's very difficult to build in any um, performance guarantee um, in a project like this uh, that would require that the downtown, the amenities actually get finished. So um, I hope that you have a chance to focus on that and figure something out um, because uh, it's really important. We can't let them just build build and build, you know, hundreds of apartments and then whoops, um, housing downturn or, or, you know, recession and uh, can't be done. And uh, we got an empty downtown. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Hamill. Can, can, Do you want to respond to that? Well, you might not want to, but a couple of counselors want you to. So. Sure, I, I'll just um, go back to my recommendations. And one of them was to find that balance between trying to be as sure as you can that you get what you want, but also not tightening too much because that will actually make it harder for them to succeed in what you want to have happen. So I think there is a there is a, that middle ground and that's part of if you decide that's the direction you want to go and that would be sort of the next phase is figuring out those details. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. We're going to exercise responding to public comment. Okay. And I just feel the need to do it because the gentleman that spoke before about, about the survey is correct. Uh, there was a dissatisfaction about uh, availability of affordable housing in the town. But if we're going to use the survey, I, I need to see the whole picture because 76% of the population says there's too much too fast. So as I sit on the council, I hear that loud and clear. I understand the needs of the developer and somewhere in the middle, there's a balance. And that's what my job is to try to find that balance. And to Kevin's point, uh, this is not gonna be a rush job, but I can guarantee you, I've been trying to get numbers for about eight months. And uh, that's the starting point for me was, are the numbers. So there's been a delay of six to eight months just to get the numbers. So we're ready, willing and able to sit down and have the conversation, but everybody's gotta to come to the table and wanna play. So that's, thank you very much. Councilor Johnson. I think it's important. We did, the, the developers were kind enough to give us a 25 minute video that was produced by Dan Bacon and April Seiler. And I'm not, there was 640 units on that if you counted the, so I'm not saying that's what they're asking for and I'm not saying that's what they're given, but we have been informed on a level. What has been good is, I totally agree with Councilor Johnson and Councilor Clucci is in the beginning, we have very broad requests. And frankly, that's all that's really technically still before us, right? That's all, none of that's actually been refined. So everybody's right. But I think we've at least started, we're marching slowly forward progress. We, this has been six months, right? But we do have something in our possession, which I, we, I think we can at least do a screen grab and make it available on the agenda that actually defines a lot more of what they're looking for. And it's about 640 units if you exclude a area to the north that they still haven't defined for us. So I think I, I think that that's, to be clear, technically we don't have a refined request for any numbers, but I think we're making good progress towards it. I, right? I think we are. Um, but yeah, to Chairman Coochie's point, let's get that in the public. Let's figure out what, you know, the reaction to it. And let's try to move forward with it, so. Yeah, so just just one, maybe one question for Jeff, just kind of on this thread of, of, of time. So, you know, I know you mentioned that you know, time is money for the downs, which it matters for them. It doesn't necessarily matter for me because it's not my money. But at, at the same time, like what I'm trying to figure out, like this is very consequential to our town. It's a big decision. We do need to take our time and do this right to do it well. If it does take us a year to get to a point where we're comfortable, 
what 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 could they realistically do between now and that year that kind of keeps them moving or like at what point do we get to a point where it's a real challenge for them like i'm just trying to figure out like what is the real time rush that we need to work through that gives us the opportunity to do our due diligence lets them do things maybe in parallel that they can do without our decision so that we feel like we're at a good point where we can actually make a decision. Sure, I, I, at the risk of passing the buck, I think you'd really have to ask the development team that question. I, I wouldn't be able to answer it for them. Okay. Yeah. And I, I just want to add, it, I, you know, thinking through their initial presentation, um, it was very vague uh, and they were honest about it. They're like, we don't know if we want to invest in designing this town center because it's a, it's a big chunk to take off. I, there's no guarantee they want a town center, right? This was part of our ordinance. It's, uh, so I, I, I think at the beginning, we probably wanted it more than them. And I think they've come along like, hey, yeah, maybe we can make this work if it's a partnership. And uh, I just, you know, they'll, I'm sure they'll find a way to make money on this, this land. I don't know if it'll be a more beneficial use um, to the town. Uh, so that, you know, we have to consider that. I, I don't intend to drag this out for a year. I'm going to make you guys make a decision. Yeah. Um, I, if it's a month or two, I don't know, but it's um, just to be clear on that. It's, I, I think we're working in good faith. And, um, Councilor Kettering. Um, I've never seen this video. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it's a video of the Bay Bridge Oh, it's probably in your um, spam. Spam box. Yeah. We, I will send you it. Yeah. So is it this coordinate on town center, Microsoft, something or other? Yep. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And I shouldn't have to look at things in spam. No. Who sent it? Talk to uh, <laughs> Dan Bacon. <laughs> you'll I think you'll like it, Jamie. It's don't, a good it's a good video. Don't read too much into the spam. No, 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 no. no. But I'm just I'm just saying that it's I Microsoft. totally yeah. forgot about it. Yeah. 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 So it's well done. It's clear that the development team has put a lot of thought into how things could play out there, and they've spent some money on, on you know, defining that. Doesn't mean that's exactly what's going to happen, right. um, but uh, I thought it was good stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay, we've got four minutes before our seven o'clock regularly scheduled meeting, so I'm going to adjourn this workshop. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Jeff, certainly for for all the.
Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. This is the Wednesday, March 2nd Town Council uh, regularly scheduled meeting. Call this meeting to order and please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Tony, would you uh, take the roll call? Councilor Scyther? Here. Oh, here. here. Councilor Anderson? Here. Councilor Paul Johnson? Present. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Councilor Ken Johnson? Here. And Chairman Clucci? Here. All are present. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members of the public that would like to comment on any items that are not on our agenda this evening? I see one in person. Mr. Green, come on up. Name's David Green, live at 135 Beach Ridge Road. I was last here at your February 2nd meeting and we had a little lively discussion up here amongst two people and myself. I wanna make something perfectly clear that I don't know I did. I have no use for surveys, okay? Because you may as well take your Ouija board, your crystal ball and your tarot cards to try to figure out how you can deal with license numbers from survey numbers, okay? They are about as consistent as nothing and reliable as the dirt out in a parking lot, okay? Because you have to understand, first of all, you don't walk along the flats and count holes, okay? That's not how it's done because that's not what you're after is a head count. You're after a size count. And it's done by the millimeter, okay? And you got to bend over and you basically dig one cubic foot of mud. And it's all sifted through a sifter and you got to stand there and count them, okay? You know how many clams there are out there that are that big? Try it, okay? You need to educate yourselves to what a survey is even gonna accomplish, okay? The state mandated it years ago. I don't believe the state even mandates it now. The town certainly doesn't have it in the ordinance, okay? I don't want anybody here to think that surveys are a good thing because they're not. As I told you, three councilors five years ago who don't know any more, and I'm not belittling you, they didn't know any more than you people did last month, but they mandated surveys and data. Useless data, I'm sorry. You have to understand that, okay? Now, I wanna recommend something to each of you. I know you're all very busy, okay? Take, take an hour sometime and watch last month's shellfish committee meeting, please. You'll get a little insight into what, what you're dealing with down there, okay? Now, Mr. Hamill had to go and give him a real nice pep talk, okay? because they're not doing anything, all right? They were mandated five years ago to go get data and they haven't gotten any data yet. And let me tell you about the surveys they're planning. They had two surveys, I don't know if it was spring and summer and they also had one in October. Well, guess what? They're so poorly managed and planned, there's only one person showed up to the survey in October, okay? And one person can't do a survey by himself. Okay, so that didn't even happen. So you wonder why there's no data. There's no data because they're not doing anything. And you can blame COVID all you want, but this goes back for five years before you even knew what COVID was. So don't, don't think I'm in any kind of favor of surveys. You're better off to go put your money on a landing report like I did back in 2019 when we had a really poor year and everybody was clamoring, we want six more licenses. And I went to the shellfish committee and I said, look, this is the lowest year in the last 20 years of a harvest, okay? You, that, those are facts. The landing report's a fact, okay? Because that's the data the DMI has. That every time you sell a clam, it goes to them, okay? The survey you do, as I told you last month, those clams are right there right now three years from now when you got a marketable size clam 
The majority of those are not there, okay? Because I could show you pictures that would make you cringe of milky ribbon worms out there eating those things as fast as they can bore into them. And it's not pretty, okay? And they, they, the biggest threat to the shellfish industry around here are the harvesters, okay? And that's a one-way ratchet. When numbers go up, they never come down. And don't you think the DMI won't let you lower the numbers? That, that's, that's false, okay? You can lower these numbers. It's up to you people. Not the DMI. And you present any kind of case to them, you could have lowered the numbers. You don't want to put anybody out of work and you take a little more pressure off the shellfish. Okay? That's, that's the truth. Do, do yourself a favor and watch, watch a shellfish committee meeting. You, you might learn a little more. Okay? You, it's nice. I had emailed Mr. Cludia. Uh, he's on the right track. He's figured out things that are called P90s. Anybody else know what a P90 <laughs> is? Of course not. Okay. But these are the facts that they have to deal with to figure out what you want to do with license numbers. Not strictly on P90s. It's not on surveys. It's not on landing reports. It has to be a little bit of hmm, experience. Okay. But experience isn't going. Oh, there's plenty of clams out here. So, Mr. Green, I, I, I've given you a lot of leeway. No, no, it's fine. I, I appreciate you coming. I will say that I, I know an awful lot more than the last time you spoke with us about this. Subject, That's what it's all about. Which is barely scratching the surface of you know what would be considered you know expert expert knowledge. I did watch the shellfish committee and meeting. I, I thank you for and, doing. Uh, I did do some research online. I do know what a P90 report is. I actually understand that a lot of our grounds are closed um, because of water quality issues. And uh, so, uh, but I'm not. I'm not there. I, I haven't been working in this space, and and but I'm going to try. No, no, that's over fine. The course of the next year to, to get better educated on it. If, if everybody tries, you'll you'll get somewhere. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, up next is approval of the minutes from the, oh, sorry, did anybody want to, I, I kind of stole the thunder there. Anybody else want to respond to Mr. Green? Absolutely. Okay. Um, approval of the minutes from the February 16th, 2022 town council meeting. Do I have a motion? Second. Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> Tody, would you call the roll? Councilor Sider? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Paul Johnson? Yay. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Councilor Kenneth Johnson? Yes. And Chairman Clucci? Yes. That's unanimous, thank you. Item six is adjustments to the agenda. Does anybody have any adjustments to the agenda that you'd <clears throat> like to introduce? See none. Uh, I signed the treasurer's warrants before the meeting this evening and item eight is the town manager's <coughs> report. Thank you, Mr. Oh. Chairman. Uh, just uh, very quickly, a couple of updates. Uh, this is certainly high budget time for me and staff. Uh, Friday, last Friday was the internal deadline for departments to submit their requests to me. Uh, they've been kind of uh, coming in over the last few weeks, but a uh, big rush on Friday, I assure you. Uh, I still haven't seen the budget all put together in kind of one piece. I've seen it in pieces, and it's really important to kind of see it all come together. It should be, uh, uh, I should see that as soon as tomorrow. So uh, we'll be digging in very deep. Uh, as part of the budget this year, we'll be looking at uh, and recommending use of ARPA funds. And I know we've had an initial conversation with uh, Chair Clucci, uh, just running some ideas um, by there. It, it does appear that the, the, the uh, say simplest, and I think really the best way to do it is to really look at our capital investment uh, portfolio. And really, uh, I think there's multiple opportunities uh, over several budget years to, uh, to move those funds through our, uh, you know, through our financials and really provide some, some significant benefits. So uh, stay tuned on that. It will be part of the budget presentation. And to that end, the presentation is scheduled for March 30th. That's a joint uh, presentation by myself and the superintendent. And then uh, we'll get underway with uh, the adoption process. I, I believe we're, uh, we're still on general schedule. We'll be looking at second reading in uh, the second meeting in May. Um, and there's a lot to be done in between for sure. I'll be working with the finance committee as they do really the heavy lifting and do the detailed uh, review, meeting with department heads and such. Uh, but uh, we look forward to it. Also, I, I wanted to comment further on a project I think I made passing reference to. Um, I made mention of the, the constant, fairly constant flooding on the stretch of Route 1 across the Scarborough Marsh. And that really got me thinking that uh, 
uh, particularly with a lot of talk of, uh, of climate change and resiliency and sea level rise, and also, also infrastructure monies uh, at the federal level, that we ought to start talking about what the solution is, because it's not going to take care of itself and it's only, only going to get worse. Uh, I'm really pleased to report that we've had tremendous reception from uh, DOT and uh, the main emergency management agency. Um, DOT, unbeknownst to us, had already started to do conceptual design uh, on that stretch and also a stretch of uh, Pine Point Road close to the Audubon, which is an area that doesn't flood across the road, but uh, the water on a king tide or high tide uh, is very often up into the pavement and certainly the parking lot at the Audubon. So very pleased with the reception so far. Uh, on your agenda this evening, um, asking your consideration of a resolution, which is a prerequisite to apply for some uh, state funding. And this partnership would be with DOT. We'd really run the public engagement, public process side of things. And uh, really interested in doing, doing that on a much larger scale. Just imagine Route 1 carries 30,000 cars. So this, this engagement doesn't include just Scarborough residents, though that's certainly a, uh, a component of it, uh, we're going to have to, uh, you know, reach a much larger audience and therefore need some additional resources. So very pleased uh, uh, with the reception that we've had so far. And I think, uh, um, you know, we're going to be able to make a difference sooner than later there. Uh, some may have noticed there was a crane here in the parking lot of public safety building. Uh, AT&T did um, uh, raise the cellular panels, if you will, up onto the tower. They're fixed in place now. They have all their equipment uh, in the public safety building. And in the next few days or a week or so, they'll be doing running all the lines for connecting the antennas. So I would say within the next two weeks, probably before you meet next, uh, that will be an operational um, um, program. So hopefully residents, uh, those with AT that are at and customers, interested to hear how service is, uh, uh, I know a number of you have talked to me over the years, so uh, interested in what your experience is after that. And lastly, I'd like to do something a bit unconventional, but I hope it's appreciated. I beg your indulgence, uh, really in response to many complaints, concerns uh, from members of council and the public uh, with our website, particularly its visual appeal and its searchability and, and overall navigation, we have undertaken and are ready to launch a new website, which we hope will improve in all those categories. Uh, that new launch is actually this Friday. Uh, we are intentionally not doing tremendous fanfare around it. We wanna make sure that we're gonna do some good education around it. But uh, a component of that is also a matter that was funded in this year's budget, which is a software product, a commercial product called Board Docs. Uh, it's a system that helps us manage information really for public meetings. And it really has, uh, even has a component that helps you run the meeting in public. The reason I bring that up and why I wanted to get your attention in the public tonight is that with the launch of the new website, the display of that information will be through board docs. Uh, we're not gonna implement it full with the council until after budget, probably early summer, but uh, people will see things a bit differently. And I do have uh, Brian Butler here with us uh, this evening, who is our webmaster. And if you would, I'd love him just to spend a few minutes to give you a, a quick look at the website and, uh, and also uh, uh, the new look of board docs. Brian, I just let you in as a panelist. <clears throat> so I think he's gonna share a screen. He's got a few slides just to uh, help walk us through this fairly quickly. Great, thank you. Everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Perfect, go ahead, Brian. Great, uh, well, thanks uh, Thanks for inviting us uh, to give a brief intro of the new website. Uh, I know we kind of have a limited time frame here, so uh, I was hoping to just provide a brief overview of the new site, uh, what's that, what that is going to uh, look like. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. While Brian's doing that, uh, the school brought their new site online just before the school year, and that was the schedule uh, that they go first to really meet the school year time calendar, and then we come second just after the new year. So here we are. Uh, so as Tom mentioned, after uh, really diving into the feedback that we received over the last year and a half, 
Um, this is feedback from the public uh, staff, uh, also website, uh, website survey that we had done. Uh, we had moved to adopt this new platform that would really address some of the specific requests in areas that were lacking and are lacking on the current site. So uh, over the last several months, we've been working to upgrade the current town website to uh, the platform that you see here uh, in order to make some of these new features available to the public um, as well as town staff. Um, so this Friday is, is when we're slated to go uh, live. Uh, so I'll just, there are actually a number of features, um, uh, really great improvements with the new platform, uh, but I'm just gonna focus on a couple of them here. So first and foremost, this, this is the message that uh, users will get when they enter the new website. Uh, these are page pops and something that we can really use uh, and leverage from a communication standpoint. Uh, so I'm gonna look out of that. This is just an overview of the home page here. And one of the bits of feedback that we've received um, is, uh, and there have been several, uh, but one of them was staff directory. And uh, with this new platform, uh, we have a fully searchable staff directory now. Uh, and this is segmented by department, but also includes um, the entire staff as well. So simply by going to the staff directory, you have the option to search for individuals, um, also search by department, uh, and then click on um, staff member's name and you're presented with some information, uh, contact info, email, uh, phone number. One of the biggest improvements with the new platform and actually probably the most uh, commonly mentioned um, thing that was lacking in the current website is site searchability. Um, this new platform is a va is vastly improved uh, user's ability to do that. Uh, by searching, you know, using keywords to search on the website, uh, it yields results that have uh, page previews as well as highlight the keywords that you search for. And I'll demonstrate that in just a moment here. This is kind of a feature that's similar to what uh, the website had a couple iterations ago where you would be able to search a term and then have some uh, uh, preview results um, and then you know, select based on those results, which page you'd like to visit. And to kind of pivot off of this, as Tom mentioned, uh, one of the uh, requests along with the site searchability was being able to do that with meeting minutes and agendas. And by coupling the website launch with the introduction of board docs, uh, it's gonna make for a really powerful uh, and robust uh, ability to search. And currently board docs is only set up uh, with town council right now, uh, but after budget season, in addition to some training that um, the staff will receive as well as uh, town council, uh, I think more in terms of overview and how to use board docs uh, board docs will be expanded to include other boards and committees as well. Suck in the gut. <laughs> I did that. So until the end of budget season, uh, this kind of has a displayed like it's like it's been displayed historically, where there's a table and users are able to click on individual items in the table. It pulls up a separate tab uh, and they're able to view the minutes and agendas. Uh, and from my understanding, uh, council members will still receive the PDF copies um, in their email uh, during this time. It's just that, you know, specifically for town council meetings, we'll start including this information on board docs as well. And currently, uh, as I mentioned, board docs is only linked to the town council page at this point. But in the future, the goal is to extend that to all the other boards and committees as well, uh, including uh, the addition of historic meeting minutes and agendas to our board docs page. 
So clicking that link will bring us over to our board box page. You can kind of see we have some general information on the town council here, featured meeting minutes, uh, and some documents as well. I'm one of these. Well, there's a couple guys in coats. <laughs> And this is just a preview of how this information is organized. And like I said, additional uh, training and uh, overview will be provided uh, after budget season. But to comment a little more on the searchability, we have the option up here to employ this really granular search. And this is within board docs and this addresses several comments that we've received uh, over the last year or so, and that being able to dive into individual meeting minutes and agendas just by keywords. So by putting in the word traffic, this will pull up uh, agendas, minutes, uh, attachments, anywhere the word traffic is mentioned. So it's really neat and powerful way for users to be able to go in and find like a very specific uh, agenda um, just based on keywords. And by clicking one of those items, it will bring up the agenda. Then you can, or the attachment, and you can navigate to that agenda. Brian, how much history do you plan to load? Uh, I, I think, it, well, <laughs> from my knowledge, I, I think the history goes back to pre 1800s. And I, so I, <laughs> uh, I don't know if we'll go back that far, but um, I, I think it'll just be a, a process. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, again, starting with the town council, and then I think once there's a, a good number of years, and I, I'm not sure, perhaps there's legal requirements too, as far as how many years back need to be available. Um, but I know that the goal is to start with this and then kind of move into some of the other boards and committees. But it, it, so on a going forward basis, you know, what we're doing here going forward will certainly be available. I think the question is, how about the archival information? Um, it seems to me that's going to be uh, quite a bit of work to, to load all of that old information into that new system. Right, right. And so to kind of bridge that gap, um, what we've done is moved. And I know right now, perhaps I think there's actually a more recent version of this page that I, I haven't published yet. But on some of the other boards and committees, you can see any, any um, minutes and agendas going back. I think some of them go back to 2013, whatever's been available on the website since we moved from just paper copies to then hosting information online. All of those should be available until it's moved over on board docs. And then uh, after that, uh, that information will be accessible instead of listing all those meetings on the website. Uh, will rely more on linking out to board docs so that users are able to use um, the additional functionality that's offered with that service. So uh, just a couple uh, last things. Um, with the new platform here, uh, ADA compliance is uh, uh, very big uh, and something that uh, this new site will do very well. Um, it's not available on here yet, but we'll have some additional tools that will help with uh, readability, such as magnifying the text on page using a ruler. Uh, and there's actually a translation feature now that's built into the site as well for uh, users who English isn't their uh, first language or um, they prefer to view it in another language like French. And what's neat is that it does the live translation on the page as well. Uh, it's fully responsive on mobile devices. So people using cell phones, tablets uh, will have no issue uh, or very little issue if any viewing uh, the new website on, on those devices. Uh, and one of the other really neat features that addresses some of the uh, comments and feedback also is being able to uh, subscribe to posts uh, or news posts across the website. So that's, uh, that's basically all I have. I, I know, again, we have a, a short window here. So that was just a real gauntlet run of the, of the new website here. So thanks, Brian. Look forward to seeing it, Brian. Thank you.
Thanks, Brian. And this is something that we're going to certainly um, build upon. Uh, we want to build out from this point. We really see this as kind of the basic framework. And uh, the, there's a lot more endless possibilities for us to kind of make things more accessible and easier for, for folks to find. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, Mr. Chair, I, uh, my report is complete, available for questions. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Tom? I have a question for Tom. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get a commitment from the town manager and the superintendent to uh, do the community engagement on the budget. We can figure out some of the logistics, but kind of like you used to do mm -hmm. back back in the day, pre-COVID and all that, maybe I think with some vehicles, as uh, Councilor John Anderson and I are going to be, uh, let's talk Scarborough mm -hmm. at the end of April. Can't wait. That might be a platform or something, but yeah, I, I, I won't commit to what we've done historically just because I don't think it was terribly effective, but I will blindly commit to, to doing something and, and I'd be open to your suggestions as to the best platform to do that on. Thank you. Any other questions for Tom? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> seeing none, uh, we have a order number 22-017, a 7 p.m. public hearing on the new request for marijuana licenses from Pimo Lab LLC located at 23 Washington Avenue for a medical marijuana products manufacturing facility and an adult marijuana products manufacturing facility. And schedule final approval for Wednesday, March 16th, 2022. This is brought to us by our assistant town manager who is remote. Um, can we let Leah, Liam, you're there, aren't you? I am, how are you? Okay. Very good. Would you like to introduce this for us? Sure. So just briefly, this is a, a new license request. This is a new facility in town. It's one that's being retrofitted uh, as we speak for a laboratory setting. Uh, we don't have any, have any reason to believe that there's concerns with odor with this since it's manufacturing and largely extraction. Uh, the only thing I would know in terms of the, the item before you is that this is actually intended to be first reading in public hearing with second reading and final approval on the 16th. Very good. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, before we do this, I, I need to open it up to the public. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak to this item? Okay. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. We have a motion and a second and discussion. My only discussion, it just doesn't say first reading on the agenda. So mm -hmm. just want to clarify we're having first reading. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tony, would you call the roll? Councilor Scyther? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Paul Johnson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Councilor Ken Johnson? Yes. And Chairman Kuhl. Yes. Thank you. Point of order. Since we're all in the same room, does Tony have to do a roll call vote or can we just raise our hands? Um, it's not required. Okay. It's, uh, uh, it's kind of my discretion. Okay, uh, so that's fine. I just wanted to... And I'll flip flop that. Point that out. <laughs> but because we have remote participants, I, I, I've been. Sure. Okay, great. Holding Thank to you. that formality, but it's not required. Thank you for answering my question. Um, next up is resolution 22 001, act on the request to support resolution 22 001 to make Scarborough more resilient to climate change. And this is brought to us, I, I believe, by a sustainability um, coordinator. resource coordinator. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tom, are you going to introduce this yes, or is Jamie? Please do. Okay. Yeah, I foreshadowed this during my comments just a moment ago. Uh, this is in relation to uh, really Maine's 2020 Climate Action Plan. Uh, the governor's office uh, has created something called a Community Resiliency Partnership uh, that's really intended to uh, seek those partnerships with all sorts of organizations, including local governments, to advance some of the priorities in that Climate Action Plan. In particular, they do have something called a community action grant, grant, which we'd like to apply for. Some of the prerequisites of that grant require us to do a self-assessment, which we've done uh, to uh, hold a community meeting, which was uh, held last Wednesday, the 23rd. And I believe some 30 participants were part of that. It was a lively discussion. Uh, in part, the input received that evening helped uh, and makes its way into this resolution. And finally, uh, the, the legislative body needs to pass resolution. So, uh, with the passage of this, uh, we will move forward. As I said, our, our intent is to apply for up to $50,000. I'm not sure if we'll go for all of that, but it's really to provide the public engagement and public process side uh, of these two projects um, 
on Route One and Pine Point Road. Thank you, sir. There motion. Uh, so moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. Council Johnson. Uh, question for Tom: Was the thirty people that showed up to the meeting last Wednesday were those primarily members of the public or? Uh, a, a number of our committee members were there and, and active, uh, but there were cer certainly members of the public that uh, pers I was personally not aware of uh, yep. previous to that. Uh, April, I'm not sure if you had the occasion to be there. Yep, I was there, um, and I would say that 90% of the participants who chose to speak, to recognize to, be, to, to speak and make a comment were members of the community, members of the public. There, there were some really good comments, yeah. so yeah. It's, 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 it's worth a watch. So I guess I, my comment to this is, you know, it, it strikes me where if, when 30 people are in this room, that's a lot of people. And that would make, on, on any decision we're making, that would make an impact on us, mm -hmm. right? If 30 people were staring at us or had public comment. And so I think that this is a huge blind spot, in my opinion, for me personally as a counselor. And if we want to talk about things that are of mind of our residents and people that are concerned, what people are concerned about, there's 30 people that took their time out of town hall to come up and speak to it. And so I think it's important for all of us that don't, that don't attend all those, nor should we, we're not liaisons to all this, but there's, there's a lot of people in this community that care about a lot of things. And I just think this is great evidence of it. And I, and of course I'm going to support this, but I'm going to support it with the acknowledgement that I need to do a lot more to understand what we're doing as a town. Cause frankly, I don't until it comes, something comes before us like this. So. Thank you. Ms. Either. So to speak to Paul's point, uh, indirectly, hats off to Jamie um, Finch, our Fitch, our sustainability coordinator. Um, she was able to pull together um, the people required in terms of um, being able to put together a presentation, and then uh, she managed the meeting. It was a remote meeting, uh, so people logged in via Zoom. Um, but in order to fill the prerequisite for the application, we had to have a public meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and she really did a great job with outreach on that with help of other staff, I'm sure. But mm -hmm. you know, she targeted all of our um, committees that might be interested and then encouraged those committees to reach out to people who would wanna come. And so in a very short amount of time, she generated a lot of interest in this particular event. So great job. Mm -hmm. Councilor Katarina. Yeah. Um, I had another meeting last Wednesday, but I did sort of listen. I had one thing on Zoom and another on my phone going. And it was interesting to hear the interest from members of the community. Um, I know um, I'm very interested in this myself. Uh, and I do think it's important that as a community, we do start doing some more focus on this for the very reason they say here, we have coastal flooding, intense rainstorms, um, and it, it just sea level rise alone, uh, and the impact is gonna be on the marsh. Um, the the uh, weather changes we've seen, uh, people, a lot of people in Scarborough on wells um, may be impacted um, by drought, for example. Um, so I, I think this is, awesome. I see this as a first step and uh, kudos to uh, the sustainability <laughs> committee and Jamie for putting this forward. Thank you. Councilor Anderson. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in support of this, um, but to echo some of what, what Councilor Johnson said, uh, I, I felt the gap when we were doing our goals that we missed this as a theme. And I think we have enough goals. So I know we had to make some choices. <laughs> But, but I would encourage us to think about maybe how we might want to make sure that this does get more elevation, this theme of conservation and, and you know, climate change, because I think it is important to the community. There's a lot of things that other towns are doing, like South Portland with their One Climate Future Plan that, again, I don't know if we have that, that level of organized plan right now. I think we have a lot of great groups doing a lot of great things, but and I know in our comprehensive plan, this was a theme and maybe coming out of the long range planning work that's happening, they're gonna kind of come out with some sort of plan. But the question is, is really what is our, our, our orchestrated approach on this? And do we have something that maybe Jamie's working on that we're just not aware of that's really trying to kind of culminate all these great ideas into an actual action plan that, that brings a little bit more um, muscle than just doing a resolution that we can work through and, and move forward. 
Yeah, for, for my purposes, I've been searching for uh, an entry point into this. You know, climate change is something that I'm not an expert in, but this is something tangible. You know, I'm seeing our plow, uh, you know, plowing icebergs off Route 1. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong. And, and the solution, we've got to be part of that solution. So I think, I think it has been a bit of a blind spot, but finding those entry points where it's relevant and makes sense and it's something, some actionable things at the local level, this was a prime example. Uh, I'm sure there are others as well. Yeah, I'll just add that uh, driving by the marsh today, it was very nearly going over the road again. And I don't know that there was anything special um, going on. So uh, it's kind of a sign of where we're at. Um, we, at our next regularly scheduled meeting, we are gonna be having a joint session with Cape Elizabeth Town Council to discuss the other sort of road, the one that borders Cape mm -hmm. Elizabeth. and. You know, the impacts of sea level there have, have been substantial as well. And I guess the final point, uh, Councilor Hamill, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I know uh, Ordinance Committee began to talk about uh, uh, electric vehicle charging um, requirements, and that's gone through committee. That's something I think uh, they'd like the full council to, to hear. So that's something I'll look to leadership to schedule in the next weeks or months. Yeah, we had a good discussion in Ordinance Committee about that, and it is another example of of another world I know nothing about. So, and our only appeal to the sustainability committee was that, uh, you know, in gathering groups of people together, you mentioned 60 people at their meeting uh, recently, um, we should really strive to make sure that we've got a broad representation of uh, what we refer to as uh, uh, stakeholders. stakeholders, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, I think this group has done a good job of that so far, so. Thank you. So we're we're, we're dipping our toe in the water. It's rising, but we're dipping our toe in the water. We didn't have to dip, it came to our toe. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> okay. Touche. Uh, with that, Tody, would you call the roll, please? Councilor Scyther? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Paul Johnson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Councilor Kenneth Johnson? Yes. And Chairman Pucci? Yes. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, old business is uh, next. Order number 22-016, act on the request on the council order approving the second amendment to the downtown omnibus municipal development and tax increment financing district and development program. This is brought to us from the finance committee. Paul, would you tee it up again? Uh, sure. Uh, let me read right here. At the time of the downtown TIF district was created, there was recognition that a tax shift. No, this is worth reading. There's recognition that a tax shift benefits were not maximized with the town sheltering only 3% and that this should be revisited. With the town no longer a minimum receiver, re being a minimum receiver relative to the funding formula for the general purpose aid for education, the tax shift benefits have increased to 57.6%. As part of the analysis to consider what the capture rate could be, many operational and capital expenses that were already being paid for were identified as if they were paid for by TIF revenues and the tax shift benefits would be enjoyed. Further, with a conceptual discussion of the community center and pool and perhaps others, uh, ta uh, well, actually not schools in this case, and amendments would create an option for covering these TIFs with a uh, cost with TIF revenues. For these reasons, the finance committee has recommended an expansion of the allowable project use in the development program and also to increase the capture rate to 100%. So we uh, made our list of allowable expenses more robust, does not mean we're committing to any of them. And then we're taking full advantage of the tax shift um, advantage and cranking it up as high as we can go because it's as much money as we can, we can benefit. With a recognition that there's a possibility maybe five, six, seven years down the road, we actually might reduce that. that that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. And discussion. Councilor Hamill. Yeah, I wanted to uh, just say that I thought the town, the the committee, and also the uh, the committees involved, as well as the council at large, did a good job of uh, extending the time frame for us to deliberate on this, even though we did we had some deadline pressure. So I think that that extra week or two really did make a difference, and. Um, I know this is a complex topic. The only thing, my only appeal is that I think sometimes when we're looking at things like this, we treat it as found money, but there's also a habit of us sort of uh, earmarking it for expenditures before we even you know receive the money. So I just, you know, there's sort of a bottom line part to this as well. And I hope we don't, we don't lose sight of that as we move forward and capture more money. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. 
Okay, seeing no other discussion, I just thank Paul for uh, steering this through. There's been a lot of process around it. Uh, and it's you know surprisingly quiet here, but uh, to me, since I've been on the council, this is one of the most impactful decisions that I, mm. I think we're going to make. I think this is going to save the taxpayer an awful lot of money. And uh, you know, if we do nothing else, well, <laughs> This is something that I think uh, that we've enacted that I think will have a lot of benefit for Scarborough. So, uh, Tony, would you call the roll? Yes. Councilor Sider? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Paul Johnson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Uh, Councilor Ken Johnson? Yes. And Chairman Kluge? Yes. That's unanimous. Thank you. Next is order number 22-018, act on the name posted to the Board of Assessment Review and Scarborough Housing Alliance by the Appointments and Negotiations Committee on February 16th, 2022. This has come to us from the Appointments and Negotiations Committee. Uh, Councillor Hamill, is there anything you'd like to add? As soon as I can scroll to, yeah, yes. Um, I would like to read this into the record as soon as I can scroll through the TIF. Uh, it's only 222 pages of it. There's bookmarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are bookmarks too. Uh, Yeah, there are bookmarks on the left hand margin if that's uh, helpful. Uh, that would mean nothing. Four docs, it'll be easier for docs. <laughs> one more. There we are. The appointments <laughs> and I was going to ask Brian to explain the Boolean do loop in terms of you know how to navigate the new website, but I thought I could do that offline with him. The appointments and negotiations committee recommends the following appointment: Leroy Crockett as second alternate to the board of appeals, term to expire on 2022, and to the housing alliance as a full voting member with a term to expire 2024. Uh, and I'd just like to say, I mean, Leroy Crockett has served in many uh, capacities for a long period of time in town. Um, you know, he's, I think he was also on the Board of Ed for a while. So, uh, you know, we're happy that he's, you know, continuing to want to devote his time and energy to serving the town. Thank you, sir. Any members of the public like to comment on this? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second? Any discussion? All those in favor? There you go. I'll mix it up for you. <laughs> that passed uh, unanimous. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there we go. Next up is order number 22 019, act to authorize the town manager to sign a new license agreement with Ryan McPherson doing business as Nunsuch Oysters LLC and with Matt Hassler and Sam Nigren doing business as Salt Wind Farm, Sea Farm for use of the south side of the town pier for working floats. And Tom, you're bringing this forward? Yes, uh, the council may recall none such oysters uh, held a license agreement for better part of 10 years. That business was sold to Mr. McPherson. Uh, he appeared before you wanting to assume the rights and responsibilities of that license agreement. The council agreed to for a one year period and really directed the coastal waters and shellfish folks to uh, review this, spend some time to understand it and report back. In the intervening months, uh, there's actually a, a, a second um, entity, this Saltwood um, Sea Farm uh, emerged uh, asking for similar uh, consideration. So placing essentially a, an, an identical float next to Mr. McPherson. So we're able to kind of pair those up. Um, I've had negotiations with both parties, essentially, this allows them to uh, place a float, a working float, uh, on the inside of the pier, which is an area that doesn't uh, currently, uh, you know, impact any of the commercial fishing activity that that occurs. Um, I've also been able to negotiate with them uh, that at their cost they install certain um, their steel sleeves, if you will, on the on the wooden uh, piles. Um, these floats ride up and down as the with the tide. And there are wear marks over time naturally. So they'll be start installing protective uh, steel sleeves uh, to reduce that wear. And there's a, a thousand dollar annual fee for their um, the benefit of placing those there. Um, and I guess lastly, I had initially negotiated a five year term, Coastal Waters and others uh, wanted that three years. And so we modified the, the license agreements accordingly. Thank you, sir. Are any members of the public that would like to speak to this item? Seeing none, uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. 
Any discussion? Councilor Hamill. Thank you. I'd just like to add, uh, there was a good discussion uh, among Coastal Waters uh, on this. And, uh, you know, they suggested a one-year lease to kind of see how it goes and then reevaluate. Um, there were concerns expressed about the use of the float and other uses of the pier. So there's also under review uh, potential repairs to the pier. So I don't want to get off on topic, but I also want to uh, please to report it. Uh, there was no no uh, discussion about milky sandworms uh, or surveys that was required <laughs> in this decision. Very good. Any other discussion? Okay. All those in favor. And it's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, order number 22-020, act on the request from the town manager to authorize the town clerk to purchase voting booths from the ARPA funds in an amount not to exceed $38,000. Um, yes, Tom? this is an item that was in our uh, capital projects for FY23, and I had full intentions of bringing it forward as part of that package. Uh, the town clerk has brought this matter to me. It's no surprise. We've known for years that our aging um, um, uh, infrastructure booths and, and related uh, materials really needed to be replaced. And we have an opportunity with the ARPA funds. This is a qualified legitimate use. Uh, and uh, otherwise I would have been um, going through the budget process. Uh, the clerk reminded me or, or asked me that it would be great to have these functional and in use for the June primary. Mm -hmm. And for that to happen, we really need to seek your authorization tonight so we can get the items ordered and delivered. So, um, Tody, I'm not sure if you have anything further to comment in that regard. No, it's just really getting harder for the, the gentleman to pull, put the machine, uh, the booths together. Uh, we're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul, and we have a, a requirement that we have to have so many booths for our, mm -hmm. our voters. So, that was another reason that we would have to. I asked Tom if we could purchase the booths earlier. And these will actually be a more efficient layout. Uh, they're, they're four and one, if you will, and they're kind of around each other as opposed to next to each other. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're really pleased to, to bring this forward and look for your uh, support. Thank you. Any questions for Tom or Tony? Mm -hmm. Any members of the public that would like to speak to this? Uh, seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Johnson. It's just nice to put our money where our mouth is. We always tell Tody how great she is, and now we actually get to uh, <laughs> hopefully unanimously uh, approve the request. <laughs> I, I'm quite confident that Tody doesn't ask for something that she doesn't need. So thank you for asking, and we're happy that we can do it. Um, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up, we don't have any non-action items. Item 10 is standing in special committee reports and liaison reports. Does anybody have anything to report? <laughs> Councillor Katarina. Uh, just very quickly, I sent a, an email out to all of you regarding a hearing on Monday and some uh, a bill that's coming out that's got some things in it that would strip home rule. And I'm sure a couple of you, particularly looked at my, these two, would be like, what? They want to do what? So to just take a look at it. I know Mr. Pucci is uh, talking about perhaps preparing some sort of testimony or whatever. So anyway, mm -hmm. that's it. Um. I'll just comment on that. I, yeah. I actually, after you sent that, I did call um, Kate Dufour from yeah. MMA okay. and our local representatives. Um, and I am considering either submitting or participating sure. uh, okay. in uh, testimony. Okay. I, uh, it, we've talked about this in the past. The, the bill that's coming forward has a number of um, items that would change the way we operate. And you know, one of the major ones, uh, as it impacts us, is they've eliminated our ability to regulate um, the number of units built um, in town, in, in addition to a number of other ones, but I think that's probably the most impactful. Um, and uh, for a community that's had the most growth of anyone else in the state over the past decade, and we have an incredibly flexible zoning district in the Crossroads Planning District, I just think that uh, this is a recipe for disaster. Um, and if, so, I, and if I could just add, Scarborough's already doing a lot of the things that are, other municipalities right. should consider. We're, we really are the poster child for a lot of these things. But my concern, the concern of Maine Municipal was home rule. Is the state is, was going to take it over and say, this is how you're going to zone and this is how you're going to work. And a lot of municipalities are like, uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, Councilor Sider. 
Thank you. Uh, as the liaison to a lot of our um, committees that deal with environmental issues, um, I will certainly pass along the council's enthusiasm to uh, support and learn and hear from them more moving forward. Um, I know that that's certainly part of their long term plan um, as they set their goals for the year. Uh, along those same lines, Conservation Commission um, and PMAC will be coming before the full council. Um, this has now gone to appointments and negotiations as well as rules and policy. Um, and we have arrived at the conclusion that this should really come before the, that the consolidation of those two committees really needs to come before the full council. Um, and so that will be something that is coming at us um, hopefully very soon. Um, and then, with a little bit of overlap from what was discussed at ordinance, um, sustainability committee is also working on developing their ordinance for um, EV chargers. Um, and that's something that we have also talked about um, maybe having a workshop on. And so, you know, those are some of the issues coming out of those committees that will be coming to the full council. Thank you, ma'am. Any other liaison reports or committee reports? All right, seeing none, any council member comments? Okay, good. We're running out of gas. Next is order number 22-021, act on the request for an executive session pursuant to Title I MRSA 4056C in consultation with Levine Planning Strategies. And just so the public knows, we will not be returning to chambers. Uh, we will record our uh, final adjournment after uh, we leave executive session. So there's no need to stay. Stay tuned or connected. Uh, this will will end our meeting. Uh, do we have a motion? So, so excuse me. So moved. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor? And it's unanimous. 